Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Corey, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Hi, my name is Corey Hughes. I'm a historian and researcher on the subject of uh, the Kennedy assassination and a couple other things. And um, you can find my work at CoreyHughes.org. When it comes to researching the Kennedy assassination, how'd you get interested into doing that? Well, I've always been interested. Uh, ironically, you know, when the Kennedy movie came out in, uh, what, 92? Oliver Stone, that sparked everyone's interest, right? And it eventually led to the uh, files being released through um, the Records Review Board. And so, yeah, it had a lot of impact. And so- I still haven't seen it. Um, I tell everyone that's where they should start because you'll get everything all at once. You'll get the official story. You'll get what I call the official conspiracy theory. Um, you'll get all the propaganda um, and you'll even get hints at some Easter eggs of who really did it um, all in one. And so I tell everybody to watch that and then like watch the men who killed Kennedy. And then once they get to my research, I can help them detangle all of the fiction that is laced throughout those uh, series uh, and, and movie. But um, do you find that you fall in between more of the kind of like you have problems with the Warren Commission loan nut or people and you also have problems with the conspiracy theories as well too. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I'm a I'm a I'm a a man without a country, so to speak. Um it is only recently that people are starting to look at my work and I'm people are actually starting to take it seriously because uh you gotta think in 60 years People are still putting out books, making money off of this thing, pretending that they're experts and they don't know anything. They don't know anything at all. They talk in broad generalizations, grand theories of the CIA. Really, who in the CIA? Really, what handlers were in New Orleans? What handlers were in Dallas? Who did what, right? And this information is all out there. But these people like James DiEugenio um, will continue to make millions of dollars working with people like Oliver Stone, and they'll never solve this thing. They point out some errors in the official story while leaving other ones completely um, hidden, right? Um, there's so many in incidents of, in particular, in Oliver Stone's new uh, documentary that he did, um, uh, Through Destiny the Looking Glass, betrayed. was that it? Destiny Betrays the four-hour version. The four-hour one, right? That's like the longer version. And so, yeah, there's so much stuff in that where he like encroaches right on a real solid answer to something. And then he veers away from it at the last minute and goes, we just will never know. And it's like, oh my God, like it's it's so frustrating because the answers to everything are have been in front of our face the whole time. And so when I got into researching, let me give you a back, little bit of my background. I was a cop for about eight and a half years. I was a crime scene investigator. I've worked thousands of cases. I know how police put together cases. And in, when I approached Kennedy, I approached it the same way, you know, with the basics. And I put together a theory of the crime that I would present to a state attorney for prosecution. Plain and simple. That's how I approached the, the case. Um, and like any police investigation, you have gaps that you have to fill. And that's what cops do. They investigate crimes and then they see they they, they can make hypothesis on 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 certain things like uh, if a, if a woman is murdered and her boyfriend has a green car and they think he might be a suspect, then they should be able to say, we're probably going to find a witness that there was a green car in the driveway that evening. Right. So they have to make assumptions based on their theory of the crime. And that's what I've done with Kennedy and basically filled in every gap, every question that people ask. Uh, now, of course, there is a, a vast amount of nuance in every single incident and witness statement. But the theory of the, of the crime that I put together basically encompasses everything um, and makes perfect fluid sense when you really come to understand the backstory, the history uh, of the people involved. And one thing I'll tell people over and over again is that the study of Kennedy is the study of relationships. Like 
it does you could you can really forget about the specifics and the details of what happened in Dealey Plaza. And if you understand the relationships of the people involved and the backstory and the motivations that got them to that point, um, really, this whole thing just falls into place. But most people think that you can study Kennedy and come to understand the Kennedy assassination, which is just a, a fiction unto itself. If you're studying Kennedy and your your research doesn't go back at least a hundred plus years, like you're never going to come to understand the motivations of why Kennedy was killed. So, yeah. Um, it, it's rather frustrating when I see people like not be able to connect some dots that are very easily connectable. And it becomes obvious to me that their research was not as broad as they claim it to be. Uh, now, someone like James Eugenio doesn't really have an excuse. The guy's been studying Kennedy for 40 years. He should have been able to figure out what happened by now, and he hasn't. And people still look to people like him like he's some kind of hero. When it looks at a researcher's perspective, I understand that. But when it comes from a filmmaker's perspective, I think about keeping it kind of vague like they did. Like I enjoyed Jim's new film with Oliver Stone, um, even though it never named any, I guess, certain individuals. Um, I don't know if that's because of a liability issue, but I look at it like you got to get enough people interested into the assassination. We're talking about something that happened to him 60 years ago. And I think not going down those individual who did it aspects, because that's where the community, you know, about the JFK community is so divided on small, little minute details. And you can consider that important. That's fine in a discussion. But if you look at the Warren Commission, the lone nutter people, they never correct a small little detail that they got wrong on each other. But the conspiracy people pick through their own stuff. And that only creates like, are you crapping on my work? Well, then I got to crap on your work. And then there's that attitude where I'm like, well, how do we get the general public comfortable in entering this discussion if we've created already a hostile environment, which is like the worst possible thing? So I think that film kind of and I need, I need to point interest. out that I, I believe that that's partially intentional. Like COINTELPRO is a real thing. Yes. And I have zero doubts that the JFK research community for 50 plus years has been infiltrated by COINTELPRO. Uh, and it keeps these people spinning in circles. Well, they say Mary Farrell was an agent or some type of inside operator. Well, Mary Farrell's husband, Buck, was a longtime CIA agent who the government still refuses to FOIA any documents on. One of the station wagons used by getaway people in Dealey Plaza was lent to the motorcade by Buck Farrell. So, yeah. Mary Farrell's a gatekeeper, hundred percent. I would, I would give the Warren Commission answer to that, which is coincidence. I'm like, coincidence. The, there's only so many damn coincidences before you have to start going. There's that's a fox. That's a. Fox. There's evidence that Buck uh, Farrell was heavily involved in MK Ultra, and that's why his files are still. Um, they won't release them like at all. They just basically every request that uh, the guy from the Black Vault. I always forget his name. John something. John Greenwald. Yeah, he um, he's put in for it and he's been rejected for it. And so, yeah, it's always the same story. My fear with people requesting Freedom of Information Acts on certain things like that is that they're going to destroy those documents. Because, like, I mean, if they know someone's looking for it and knows that it exists, it's just going to get destroyed. So it's like, what's the best way to get transparency is getting enough people on board to get finally documents released. But even though we see that delay now. Here's the problem. I think that. Some files are earmarked, like never released 50 years ago, right? Like even in, in, in within CIA files somewhere. But today, there are still a million, million files out there on Kennedy or however many, like whatever they say, there's more because people don't realize what's connected to Kennedy. If there's a, I can, I could DM you a dozen incidents that are connected to Kennedy that would have their own separate batch of files that people aren't looking into because they don't think there's a connection or don't know to look for a connection, right? So there's way more out there than just what they're withholding. But um, the documents that they're withholding, in my opinion, currently, they really are irrelevant to Kennedy in particular. And I think that they are being withheld because they highlight relationships, right? Um, some of the more important files I think that they're, that, that I know that they're withholding, and I don't know why they're withholding, are related to um, a guy named Harry Hall, uh, AKA Harry Haller, uh, and another guy named Charles the Blade Taurine. Um, Also, uh, the David Morales files. And uh, those files in particular, I suspect that those files are being withheld because it will, all those files will illustrate the relationship those people had with the shooter on the grassy knoll, who's an extremely imp important person. And therefore... They'll never let those files out because it will show the relationship. And once you have the conf confirmation of the relationship between those people and the shooter on the knoll, 
then the you know it's just a, it, that's a big uh, leak they won't be able to to stop from you know getting the information out so why do you think they have files on morales because when i when i bring up morales there's a document that i have that came out of weisberg's archives where in parentheses or in quotation marks by his name when they list him says weak link and i start going either they took a deal or he they made an agreement with him to put him in like whatever that witness protection bull crap or it's because they take him out i have no clue david morales is, an, is a psychopath and he was an active participant in dealey plaza in the assassination Okay. Explain. So, well, I can show you. Can I screen share? Oh, yeah. Let me put it All right. On. I always end up having to screen share because I can only say so much. I'm glad. I'm glad at least you brought like slides or something for me. We have the same vape, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. My my uh my screen keeps going out, and I've only had it like two months. Is that an indestructible one, right? Yeah, they're semi indestructible. I've had like six or seven of them over the years. <laughs> Uh, you can screen share. All right. I'm just pulling up my slides. Give me one sec. All right. This is one example of something that really I was ecstatic to solve, but it really pissed me off because it was really not. It's hard, but not 60 years hard. So when it comes to Morales and what happened in Dealey Plaza, let me see. Do you think a lot of the um, time it takes for these researchers to get there is because each one of them focuses down an individual avenue and never looks to explore any other information? Like I figured out with talking with them as probably 60 something researchers now that they've those little bits of details exactly where they focus that Penn Jones saying of find one aspect and research the hell out of it. That is their biggest help, but also their biggest hindrance, because I think at a point they were all supposed to converge and talk about their work. But each one of them thinks that their work is the individual answer or the individual gateway to finding whatever that key to that lock that opens up the whole thing. And I'm like, if you guys put all your work together, you realize it unfolds a lot of the events and everything kind of adds together to one. Um, let me just say this, like I wouldn't have been able to do the work that I've done if over the years researchers haven't dug up incredible data. Now. The JFK research community as a whole has dug up a ton of great data, but so much data, they're drowning in it. Um, I was able, I believe, because of my my training, my uh, investigative background, my experience, I was able to bring fresh eyes to this case. Because when you look at all these researchers, none of them are cops. None of them have any official training. They just kind of winged it. Gil right? Jesus is. Gil, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with him. Gil Gilbert Jesus, I think his name is. He writes for the JFK Conspiracy Forum. Okay, so let's just talk about the shooter on the grassy knoll and how he basically got away. And the Secret Service was completely complicit. And so this is a really simple. <laughs> um, I'm going to be jumping around in my slides before I go back and explain the totality of it. But let's real just, quick, let me show before you, you do that, real quick. I'm surprised when they always show the Zapruder film, but then when someone asked the question, like, of course, there was multiple people filming this. It was an event. The president was coming through their town. And it's like the public doesn't even know that. They just picture the Zapruder film. So it's like educating them on like the 12 or 13 various films that are out there. Right. This is Alton's photo number seven. Um, so this is uh, the Secret Service car as it pulled into Dealey Plaza. Um, the, the driver and the front passenger are Samuel Kinney and Emery Roberts. They're out of sight. Samuel Kinney's the driver. Emery Roberts is the uh, special agent in charge or the assistant special agent in charge because the special agent in charge was Forrest Sorrells, who's in the lead car. OK, so um, I've got a number here, one through eight. These are the men who, you know, the official story puts in the Secret Service car. And these are the men who were in the Secret Service car up to a point. But you have two men who exit the Secret Service car. You have Clint Hill, who gets on the back of the president's limousine. And you have Dave Powers, who is an assistant to the president, who ends up getting out in Dealey Plaza. So then you go from 10 men on the car down to eight men on the car. OK. And then I'm just going to skip forward and just to get, show you uh, the conclusion of this uh, series of events that will take place. It goes from eight people on the car back here to the McIntyre photo number two. And now you're back to having 10 men on the car. So the Secret Service car picked up two men between the underpass and this and the location of the McIntyre photo number two. Do you recognize the person on the car on the right side? This person right here. Do you know who that is? No. 
Now does he look a little more familiar? The jaw looks a little bit different. But I don't know. That's David he... Morales. Okay. That's David Morales on the side of the Secret Service car. Um, let me go back and I'll explain the series of events here. So you have the the shooting starts. Uh, the president is shot. Uh, Clint Hill runs to the limousine from the Secret Service car. You can see the lead car up front. It's got Decker and uh, four Sorrels. Um, they're braking and they're off to the left. And what they're going to do is they're going to let the limousine shoot past them. Okay. Uh, this is McIntyre photo number one. A lot's going on here, but you see the lead car moved over to the left and uh, allowed the limousine to shoot past it. But then as it gets to the next overpass, you'll see that the limousine is now leaping the lead car once again. So you have this game of leapfrog that's going on here, okay? You can see the lead car leaping around the limousine, and now you can, again, see the limousine leaping around the lead car. They're pay playing a very specific game of leapfrog here. So let's go back to the McIntyre photo number one. Now, this picture is one of the most important pictures that I don't know why they allowed to uh, escape into the wild. So when we go back to see who's on the Secret Service car, it was on, on the side, you have John D. Jack Reedy and Paul Landis. Very distinct. John D. Jack Reedy has this like shaggy haircut. Paul Landis has this rounded haircut. And you can see that it's the same two guys when they get to Dealey Plaza. John D. Jack Reedy and Paul E. Landis. They're both about six foot tall white guys. Very... Um, uh, very distinct, right? Uh, you can see the, the haircut on Landis is rounded, which becomes relevant later when the Secret Service readjusts their position. Um, and John D. Jack Reedy, so you have two people on the Secret Service car, all right? Uh, and then when you jump to the McIntyre photo, you only have one person on that side. I'll zoom in. So you only have one person on the Secret Service car on that side, and this person appears to have a flat top. Uh, the person with the other one over their head, that is uh, Bennett, who had the AR-15 in the back of the car, all right? So you go from two people to having one person on the side of the car here. This person here has a flat top, right? And well, I'll get to the explanation on that here momentarily. But when you look at the statements of John D. Jack Reedy and Paul E. Landis, they both lie. So one thing I just want to point out real quickly to point out the lie in uh, Landis's statement. This is the, the photo. This is McIntyre photo number two, and it is way past the uh, triple underpass. And you can see there's only two people in the front seat. You got uh, uh, Emery Roberts and um, Samuel Kinney. That's it. There's only two people. But Landis lied. When Landis gave his statement, he, Landis said that uh, he hopped into the second or into the first row of seats next to Emery Roberts. And he did that in Dealey Plaza. But that photograph just showed clearly that he's not there. There's only two people in the front seat. So he lied about where he was. The other person who was on the side of the car was Paul E. Landis. And he also lied in his statement. In his statement, what he said was that they had gone past the triple underpass and they were on their way to the Stemmons freeway when he hopped into the vehicle. But that's not true because we have this person here who is not Landis, because Landis has the rounded haircut, this person with the flat top, and as you'll see, they have a mustache, and neither one of these fucking guys had a mustache. So uh, when you get to this photo here, and you count up everybody that's on the vehicle, what you'll find is it has two additional people on it. Um, it has the eight people who were on it, and the addition of two men, Jack Valente, who was the shooter on the grassy knoll, and David Morales. They are picked up after the uh, triple underpass, or at least uh, Dave, uh, Jack Valenti is, because David Morales gets on in Dealey Plaza when Dave Powers gets out of the car. That's the only opportunity he would have had to done it. And that would have been a split second after this. Right after this, Dave Powers gets out of the car. And look, the triple underpass is only not even 100 yards away. And then in the next photo, in the McIntyre photo, you're back, you have Morales on the side of the car, and that's it. And then you have Jack Valente, who was the shooter on the knoll. And what basically had to have happened, and we have somewhat witness corroboration, even though it's conflicting, is that a man came over the top of the knoll with a rifle and slid down and got into a black car before driving away. Now, that statement by Tom Tilson kind of corroborates the idea that Jack Valente came down the other side of the knoll 
and got onto the Secret Service car. Now, let me continue. Um, when you look at the next photo here, now you have three people in the front seat, but it is not um, it is not uh, John D. Jack Reedy, as he had said. Uh, it is Jack Valente who hopped in here, and now you have three people in the front seat. Now Landis, with his rounded haircut, is back on the outside of the car. Now let me continue. Let me follow this through. What happens is that I'm going to connect this to the magic bullet. So Jack Valente shoots a president, goes over the top of the knoll, is picked up by the Secret Service car. The Secret Service car then makes his way to Parkland Hospital, where Jack Valente places himself in the basement, where he is fetched by uh, Cliff Carter, who is an assistant to um, Johnson, and so. Jack Valenti places himself in the basement of Parkland Hospital where the magic bullet was found. He was the man who fired the rifle that shot Kennedy. Therefore, he would have had access to the bullets to plant in Parkland Hospital. And then when the bullets are found, they are later swapped out by the FBI and turned into CE-399, which is what we call the magic bullet, which is actually a Carcano round, not a round from an Enfield 303. Now, how do I know it was fired from an Enfield 303? Because also that day, Another person was arrested, and when they arrested him, they confiscated from him an Enfield 303 with 303 rounds, pointed tip 303 rounds, as was explained to Josiah Thompson and explained in his book Six Seconds in Dallas by O.P. Wright and Daryl Tomlinson, who explained the bullet they found at Parkland had a pointed tip. O.P. Wright was actually a hunter, and he actually had a 303 round with him. And when Josiah Thompson spoke with him, he showed him the 303 pointed tip round, and he said, this is what it looked like. So when you read the statements of the Secret Service, it went from O.P. Wright to Richard Johnson, and then from Richard Johnson, it went to the head of the Secret Service before making its way to the FBI. Uh, when you read the statements on the identifications of the bullet, you'll find that the FBI outright fabricated some of the interactions um, between uh, O.P. Wright and some of the FBI agents who had attempted to get an identification of the bullet. Ultimately, neither of the men in Parkland Hospital could identify CE 399 as the bullet that struck that they found on the stretcher because that was not the bullet that struck Kennedy. And it was not even the bullet that was planted. The bullet that was planted was a 303 planted by this man on the left, Jack Valente. And the man on the right is obviously his handler, and that is David Morales. So. When it comes to someone hopping off the car and having the time to shoot Kenny, when did you expect one of them to hop off the car to be able to go take the shot and then also slide? No, 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 no. That's not how it went down. Jack Valenti was on the knoll. He was on the diagonal overpass. The diagonal is a con so you have the fence line, then you have a concrete portion barrier, and then you have a the overpass itself, right? I believe he was on that diagonal or near to that diagonal. Uh, because you have to think all the stories of the Secret Service car and the president's limo stalling or stopping in Daly Plaza. Well, there's an additional witness that said that they both stopped under the triple overpass as the Secret Service car was speeding by. And that makes perfect sense to me. So that would have given them that would have given Jack Valenti at least 10 to 15 seconds to come over the top of the knoll down to the other side, which would correlate with the uh, witness statements by Tom Tilson. Even though Tilson was an off duty Dallas cop and his statements are kind of janky. Um, it, it, when I found that after having theorized what had happened, it kind of told me that, yeah, there's some shenanigans here with this statement. So. Um, but Jack Valente is one of the more important people in American history. He was the head of the Motion Picture Association of America for 40 years. He was the prop he was the head of the propaganda arm of the CIA for 38 years, running Hollywood out of DC. Is that the Operation Mockingbird type situations? Um Mock Mockingbird was in 56. Um, that's the whole another thing. That was just taking over um the news media. But no, we um the uh, <laughs> um certain forces have controlled Hollywood for a long time. And the CIA was in bed with those forces, um, you know, and kind of. Uh, well, they still influence it today. What's that? So they still influence movies today. Oh, they, the CIA runs Hollywood. Yeah. And Jack Valente is the proof of that. And I can show you a couple documents on Valente. Um, this is. Uh, so Jack Valente, I'll give you a little background on Jack Valente. Jack Valente um, was. Uh, Born in 1921, in 1936, he went to go work for Humble Oil. He worked for Prescott Bush and George Bush at the age of 15. He was a hall boy uh, for Humble Oil. He was uh, he ended up working there for 17 years. He was working there throughout the time he went to college. He ended up going off to World War II, uh, where, they, where I believe they did some fakery with his war record, um, because the guy is most certainly an assassin, not a bomber pilot, as he was alleged and none of the documents on the alleged unit that he was in ever mentioned his name. So yes, Jack Valenti is a spook. 
Uh, he worked for the probably the OSS during the war and after the war. Uh, he graduates from Harvard in 48, where he made the most important connection of his life uh, to Henry Kissinger, who was involved in running student organizations back in 47, 48. And he knew Jack Valenti and he connected Jack Valenti to none other than Lyndon Johnson. Uh, down in Texas in 1956. So yes, uh, Kissinger has been around uh, behind the scenes for goddamn ever with people you wouldn't even think. And so, but uh, Kissinger remained uh, Jack Valenti's handler after he left the White House. So let me explain how Jack Valenti gets to the White House. So in 1956, Valenti and um, LBJ meet. Um, at this time, Valenti is running an advertising firm and a PR firm called Weekly and Valenti out of Houston. But really, I think that's kind of a front. I think it was the advertising firm was kind of run by Weekly, and he was off doing other things because I've connected Jack Valenti to uh, some questionable events in South America and in the Dominican Republic in the 50s. So I'm pretty sure that he was a spook doing spook stuff using his corporation as a front job. And then in 1960, he gets the gig for Kennedy's election, and he basically handled all of LBJ's election promotion stuff. And when they decided to bring... Uh, you know, the assassination had been in the works since at least March of 63. And so uh, later on that year, I believe in September, when they made the decision on when and where it was going to be, Jack Valenti, and it was his firm that invited uh, JFK to Texas in the first place. So Jack Valenti kind of went through this uh, weird process that he was involved in every step of the way. I mean, he was involved with um, all of the promotion for the trip to Texas. He was involved in all of the booking and events for everything that Kennedy was doing in Texas. Um, he was on the board of the Dallas Citizens Council, along with a guy named Sam Bloom. Sam Bloom was one of the old owners of the Daltex building. And so Valenti was – he was knee-deep in the assassination every step of the way. Um, and so when the time came, uh, I believe that this was kind of his coming of age, his, his kind of uh, making his bones, so to speak. And so – I believe that was one of the reasons why Jack was also tasked with being the shooter on the Knoll. But also, uh, if you study the Knoll shooter and you study various statements that have been made about him over the years, you'll find that um, many people uh, knew who he was and had identified him by aliases. And I've been seemingly able to connect those aliases on the back end to a certain degree. One of those people being Otto Scorzani, who was in Dealey Plaza that day. Otto Scorzani was Adolf Hitler's um, personal bodyguard. Uh, he was like the uh, considered the elite of the elite uh, Nazi soldier during World War II. And, you know, after the war, you have people like uh, Reinhard Galen and uh, Otto Scorzani uh, coming into partnerships with Dulles, uh, Bill Donovan, uh, later on James Angleton. Uh, but the formation of the cabal that pretty much runs the world today formed at the end of World War II, and this directly connects to Kennedy because it's the same fucking people. Um, basically, uh, the Nazis were funneled out of Europe and North Africa starting in about 1945, early 1945, before the war was even over. And they, before a paperclip, everyone talks about paperclip, but before paperclip, they funneled over 230,000 Nazis out of North Africa and Europe into South America. Like that's legit. And that pretty much went on to become what's called the Galen organization. And the Galen organization is really responsible for like the state of the world today. Um, uh, the creation of NATO, the original 17 intelligence agencies, like the global security state was designed by Reinhard Galen. And I also believe that Reinhard Galen was the actual person who like the, was the architect, the physical architect of the assassination. Um, what, why is Galen one of these characters that gets mentioned about, well, why is he the architect? What, 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 what Kennedy? Cause he was that? a military strat. He was just a genius strategist. And if there was anybody who was going to do it, he was in that loop at the time. Uh, and he had been confirmed involved with a bunch of the other, uh, Israeli assassinations. So when it comes to, you, you got a guy, well, when it comes to the reason Kennedy was taken out, why do you think Kennedy was taken out? Kennedy was taken out for. Well, one reason ultimately, but really there's two reasons. Ultimately, Kennedy's number one priority in the world. Do you know what his number one priority was? I mean, I've heard various different reasons. What do you think it was? It was nuclear deep, deep I always say this word wrong, deproliferation. Um, and it's that's evident in his writings and in his speeches. Nuclear test ban treaty, but that was a surface ban. It wasn't an underground ban, so they could still test them underground. 
Right, because he knew that the machine worked slowly and he had to start somewhere. But his number one goal was to get rid of nukes. He did not want nukes whatsoever. And Israel, their number one goal was to get the bomb. And in 1963, everyone knew that they were working on it. In 1960, uh, Time magazine you know, leaked information uh, about Demona, the Demona nuclear reactor in the Jev Desert. And then, you know, the confirmation of this came from Mordecai Venunu in the 1980s, right? So uh, what you have is an immovable object and an unstoppable force uh, between Israel and Kennedy. And so, um, if, you know, if you want to get into like, uh, there's, there's more connections to Israel uh, than most people ever talk about. Like uh, in the assassination, it was a guy named Hank Greenspun. Hank Greenspun was the head of the Sun newspaper out of Las Vegas, but Hank Greenspun was a longtime Israeli fucking spy who had been smuggling uh, arms out of the country, along with a guy from Dallas named Jack Ruby. Now, Hank Greenspun and his uh, little circle of exporters of arms to Israel, which were really part of what's called the Sonborn Institute, which was a large scale smuggling operation going back to like 45. Um, uh, Hank Greenspun uh, was able to get his name removed from the indictments. And also Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby was too. And you'll know, you'll find very scarce uh, connections between, um, or published connections, I should say, between Jack Ruby and Hank Greenspun. But make no mistake about it, um, they were bosom buddies in this Israeli arms smuggling ring, along with a guy named Edwin or, or Edwin Meyer. Uh, who Edwin Meyer? If you know anything about Kennedy, no, Edwin Meyer came in to uh, Dallas the day before the assassination, met with Jack Ruby. Um, he ran a company called Aeroflux or Aero. I always forget what the name of this company is, but it was basically a, a company that worked with Arnon Milchan, who happened to be the producer of the JFK film, uh, smuggling nuclear triggers out of the country, right? So you have this twisted fucking arms smuggling network that's been going on since 1945. It involves the highest levels of, this, of the CIA post-48 because they're in bed with the Israelis. I mean, if, if you don't think that the CIA takes their orders from Tel Aviv, you don't understand the CIA. Um, so, yeah. How, how come a, a lot of researchers have not focused on the Israeli angle? That's a good fucking question. That's a really good question because it's the most obvious angle that there is. And all this stuff connects back to like Numec with the smuggling of the nuclear material out of Apollo, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, and like I said, the Sonborn Institute for 20 plus years, um, all the, they were, they were breaking into armories and bunkers, stealing our weapons post-World War II surplus and shipping it back to Israel uh, using a company called InterArmco out of Virginia. Um, which in the 60s was being run by a guy named Samuel Cummings, who was a CIA guy um, who was connected to Permindex, who was uh, the, the corporate facade that oversaw the financing of the assassination. Do you think that it's because of the fact that a lot of these like really crazy kind of conspiracy things get linked into this idea of anti-Semitism? Yeah, but it's ridiculous. I mean, that's a whole separate conversation. But uh, the, 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 the accusations of anti-Semitism are meant to cover for blatant fucking wrongdoing by a specific group of people. So I don't know how to really explain that one without going off on a major tangent. <laughs> um, tangents are always accepted. But I, I didn't realize uh, that kind of angle of things until I posted an episode and someone told me like it was just about J. Edgar Hoover's invasion into Hollywood. Um, it wasn't even JFK related. And someone just posted like, oh, Jews own Hollywood. And I'm like, I, I hope he knows. And like, I'm, I'm Ashkenazi. So it's like you're just insulting me. But I'm not trying to take over the world. But there is that kind of out there. I feel like even with some of the conspiracies, some of them go a little bit more into the fantasy thing. Like you mentioned kind of in the beginning, there is a little extra added stuff in there, which goes down a completely different path. Well, have you ever read the diaries of Theodore Herzl? Mm -mm. It should be the next thing that you read. The, this is the word. This is where. This is where most people go off the deep end because they don't understand. Um, they don't. If you want to understand the modern state of Judaism and the current perceptions of anti-Semitism, you must read Herzl because Herzl, who was a Jew and the founder of political Zionism, uh, was like a, a rabid anti-Semite himself. He felt that there were two distinct classes of Jews. And when I see what's going on in the world today, it becomes clear that Herzl was correct. Um, basically, he acknowledged that there was an upper class of Jews who controlled everything and everything that people said about them was true. And he acknowledges this in his diaries. And then he acknowledges that the vast majority of actual Jewish people are secular Jews, and he believed them to be a bad representation for the brand. Ultimately, when you read his diaries, it's just appalling the kind of stuff that he said about his own people. And so 
uh, he induced anti-Semites to basically liquidate Jewish wealth. And this is a quote from Herzl. Um, and the ultimate goal for him was to get a, a, a nation in Palestine, right? The Jewish state. And so he basically set out on a mission to inst in to instigate anti-Semitism so Jews would feel insecure all over the world and that they would rush to this new homeland of Israel. And that obviously hasn't fucking worked. Um, so yeah, it's the, the conversation is very complicated, but make no mistake about it. There is a cabal of Jews running fucking Hollywood who killed Kennedy who are all connected to Israel, the global banks, the Zionist organizations, the ADL, APAC. Yes, 100%. But does that mean the vast majority of Jews know anything about this? No, they don't at would all. You, would you say that a lot of these Secret Service members that lied um, in their testimonies, and obviously you prove with the photos that they were lying because they did what they said in their testimony didn't match that they were obviously there on the car. Um, but do you think that's just because the cover up the fact that they didn't do their job correctly? Like that's, I don't know if that's the no, cover they were in story on it. then. Okay. They were totally in on it. Um, and why were they in on it? Because this was 1963. And if you were a white male working for government, you were a conservative period. And everybody hated Kennedy, no matter how much they pretend that they loved him in the interviews they did since. And, Oh, I failed him that day. Yeah, you failed him. And the connection there is through, um, Kenny O'Donnell, Kenny O'Donnell, who was Kennedy's um, press coordinator, friend, personal assistant. He was the guy meeting with Sam Bloom. He was the guy coordinating the various ABC agencies. Sam Bloom, who was one of the owners of the Daltex building. Um, Sam Bloom is also uh, longtime partnerships with uh, the Bronfman family, Charles and Edgar Bronfman. Uh, who come from the Seagram's fortune, right? Uh, who are directly connected to a Jeffrey Epstein, funding Epstein, funding Nexium, right? Like this cabal is real as it gets. Um, and it's all connected to these uh, Zionist Organization of America, um, all these uh, Zionist organizations. There's a thousand Zionist organizations. It's really hard to keep track of them. And the goddamn problem, it really pisses me off that most people, nobody does their homework on anything. Like, there is a distinct difference between Jewish people and Zionists, but the Zionists benefit by blurring those lines. They do. They clearly benefit. Uh, I really wish more people would do their homework on, on the difference, and I really wish that more Jewish people would come to understand the crimes that the fucking Zionist world order have been perpetrating against the rest of us uh, for at least 100 years. I mean, it's sickening. I think a lot of people don't focus on this, and I'm surprised it's the first time I'm kind of hearing about all this, only because I think it's the way that society is, that nobody talks about this stuff because like stigmatized, but I think it's stigmatized on a purpose for not being able to ever – like the, the whole JFK topic, even try and talk about this, someone who's not a researcher or anyone who's not interested in the assassination, they just roll their eyes and call conspiracy, and it's that – idea of calling it a conspiracy it is a conspiracy but it's like that way we think of it now it just just dismantles any information or any other words it's basically like the mental health thing with if you call someone an anorexic if someone's diagnosed with anorexia nobody's listening to a single word you'll say because you'll lie and you'll manipulate facts and, and then you're just like you have to go through all this bs and that's kind of what the conspiracy topic is i don't know how many researchers not even researchers just act i don't talk about conspiracy like i don't use that word i don't bring it up and it, to me, it's kind of like cringy because there's no such thing as a covert action in a democracy. <laughs> That's a conspiracy. And we live in a world of covert actions within a democracy. Dude, so if, if we're you not know, a democracy. If, if you have any information on the assassination of Castro and the number of plots, we could talk about that. Yeah, that I'll tell you how many plots there were. Zero. And th what? Zero. Come on. I've seen a document that has like 13 people listed in Sydney. Gottlieb and the CIA Park. don't make their own fake documents. Give me a break. Um, they, the CIA distributes fake documents internally specifically for release, like the, the, the depths of their deceptions know no bounds. And here's the problem. After the Bay of Pigs, the CIA continued its smuggling and export operations, particularly to Israel, uh, for the weapons and the arms that they were shipping. And they were using Cuba as a jump off point from Cuba to Haiti and then to bounce off from there. So how the hell was the CIA able to continue their smuggling operations bouncing off of Cuba and Fidel Castro didn't know about it? Give me a break. Castro was a smuggling partner of the CIA, and nothing I've seen has convinced me that any of these plots were real. We're the United States of America, and we couldn't take off a – we couldn't knock off a, a, a dinky fucking uh, dictator on a small island 90 miles off our coast. Really? Give me a break. The whole assassination of Castro stories to me are just – it all it just hit me all of a sudden when I realized that when I realized that 
this is kind of, this is separate, but kind of connected. When I realized that, you know, all the money that they were raising and all the weapons that they were stealing, David Ferry stole all the weapons from the bunkers at Homa and, and another one in 61. And it was allegedly all for the anti-Castro Cubans, right? They were funneling all this money to the anti-Castro Cubans. Well, where was the Cuban people's uprising? Why was the Bay of Pigs a failure? Where would happen to all the money and all the weapons that were being shipped to the, the, the Cuban uh, rebels? It got deflected to Israel. They never got a penny of it. They never got any of those weapons. All those weapons, uh, and we know this thanks to Gordon Novell, all those weapons that they were stealing from the bunkers ended up going to Inter Arm Co. out of Virginia, which is a CIA-run weapon smuggling company, who was then shipping them through um, Samuel Cummings to Israel to fight the fucking Palestinians. So the the, the whole the whole anti Castro Cuban angle of the Kennedy assassination is a bogus front. Um, it's irrelevant. There were two anti Castro Cubans involved in the assassination, but both of those anti Castro Cubans, and we're talking about Emilio Santana and Sergio Arcacha Smith, both of those guys were actively working for the mob. They were bagmen for the mob at the same time uh, that they were allegedly running these anti Castro operations. But let me tell you. Every bit of that money and every bit of those weapons got funneled to Israel. Those guys didn't give a shit about the, about, about Cuba. That was all a CIA front, for just like the fake churches, for money laundering and raising money for covert ops. Plain and simple. I don't believe anybody gave a damn about the Cubans. Even the anti-Castro Cubans who were here, including Sergio Arcacha Smith and Emilio Santana, who were two of the shooters that day. Um, even they didn't give a shit. So, yeah, everything that we know about that era of history is mostly bogus. So, um, and you, 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 you come to understand this. Which go ahead. The organized crime aspect of things is bogus, or that that relationship has been going on since I think the forties, if I'm not mistaken. The organized crime, you mean with Cuba? Yeah, well, not just Cuba, just the relationship with the mob and the government in the first place. Oh no, 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 no. Um, the, 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 <laughs> yeah, so the the mafia and the CIA have been working together since forty seven, but they were working together before forty seven. Really, um, you can go back to the relationship with the U.S. Navy and Lucky Luciano, um, and uh, you know, running the docks in New York, right? Because they were worried about Nazis and smugglers in the in New York. And who ran the docks? Um, Albert Anastasia did, right? So who was Albert Anastasia's boss? It was Lucky Luciano. So the U.S. Navy cuts a deal with Lucky Luciano in the forties. Um, and that's kind of where the beginning of that relationship started. But you can really go back before that. And this is all in Doug Valentine's book, Strength of the Pack and Strength of the Wolf, which are two of the most – those are mandatory reads for anybody who cares about any of this stuff. Um, you can find the relationship of the U.S. government going back with, – with organized crime going back to like Arnold Rothstein when he connected the federal government to Chiang Kai-shek in China. Right. So you got at this point in time, it's 2022, we got 100 years easily provable history of the U.S. government working with organized crime. Now, the mafia kind of fell apart in the 70s, really, after Meyer Lansky left. So let me explain this about the mafia. And this will kind of hopefully make this make a little more sense. And when I say the Israelis and the fucking CIA and the mafia are all one organization, um, it really comes back to the fact that the U.S. mafia, although movies like The Godfather uh, portrayed Sicilians as having run the mob, that's nothing could be further from the truth. Jews ran the mob post-1931. Uh, in 1931, Meyer Lansky uh, had... Uh, Albert Anastasia and Lepke Buckalter and those guys take out Joe Masseria, who was the Sicilian boss of all bosses in the U.S. out of New York. Um, him and Joe Masseria were the top two Sicilian bosses, and they got whacked in 31. So Sicilian control of the mafia lasted for 10 years, 1921 to 1931. That's it. After that, the boss of all bosses of all time in the mafia, regardless of what bullshit stories you hear otherwise, was Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky controlled the mob from 31 till the late 70s when he tried to flee to Israel. And Meyer Lansky is a Jew. All the guys who worked for Lansky were Jews. Lucky Luciano, Albert Anastasia, Bugsy Siegel, Mickey Cohen, all these famous mobsters were Jews. And they were in bed with Israel post-1946, before there was even an Israeli state. And you can even find evidence that there would not even be in Israel if it was not for the United States Mafia, um, particularly because of the Sonborn Institute and Meyer Lansky's assistance with uh, smuggling stolen U.S. arms out of the country to fight the fucking Palestinians, right? So the relationship between Israel and the U.S. Mafia, they're one and the same going back to the 1946 with the meeting between Reuven Daphne, who was an emissary of the Haganah, who came and met with Bugsy Siegel in L.A., and uh, within a couple of months, Bugsy Siegel gave Reuben Daphne 50 grand, and that was 
the birth of the relationship between the two. Then Ben Gurion connected directly with Meyer Lansky. Then Men Menachem Begin connected directly with Mickey Cohen. And that leads us to the assassination. What about Traficante Giancana? Traficante is out of Tampa. Giancana is out of Chicago. Marcelo was out of New Orleans. Yeah, but those guys, Traficante and Giancana were Italian. And the only reason Jack Ruby couldn't be a made man was because he was Jewish. <laughs> no, that's, that's no. So um, Traficante was a personal close friend of Meyer Lansky. He didn't have a go-between, but Giancana did. Giancana and Meyer Lansky were not tight. Giancana had a boss and his, his boss's name was Hyman Larner. Hyman Larner was a Jew. And he was the man who controlled Giancana. And so that's the, how the fucking structure of the mafia worked, at least in the 1960s, all through the 60s. Um, it was Jewish controlled. And it had always been Jewish controlled um, post-1931. And post-1931, we have the first evidence of this um, with the assassination of uh, Mayor Anton Cermak uh, out of Chicago, who got killed in Miami um, campaigning with Roosevelt. Uh, but that's a whole tan another tangent of a story. We could do a whole show on that. Um, but um, then if you really want the the the, the final um, proof, what you have is, so we've already made, I've already told you about the connection between Reuven Daphne and Bugsy Siegel. And then you have Mickey Cohen, who was a big shot out in LA. Mickey Cohen's right-hand man was a guy named Al Gruber. Okay. So at the time of the assassination, um, Mickey Cohen um, is in jail. He will eventually get killed after the assassination. He gets murdered in jail. But Al Gruber is on the outside basically running stuff. Three weeks before the assassination, Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir come to Los Angeles. And they, like I said, um, Menachem Begin had been Mickey Cohen's personal rabbi since 49. OK, so we're talking about a multi like 15 year relationship here between the highest of the high in the Israeli fucking government and the Mossad kicking it with Mickey Cohen. Right. Uh, Mickey Cohen did so much fundraising for Israel. It's really ridiculous. And so um, three weeks before the assassination, uh, Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Shamir, send Al Gruber to go meet with Jack Ruby. Now, the official story is like, oh, it was coincidence. Uh, he hadn't talked to Al Gruber in 10 years. He just showed up. Bullshit. Al Gruber got sent there to meet with Jack Ruby to iron out the details of what was to come. The night before the assassination, Yitzhak Rabin, who was the head of the Mossad, flew into Dallas. We have the records of him being at the Air Force Base he flew into. And then his wife wrote about it in her memoirs. Okay? I have my suspicions on where Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir were in Dealey Plaza that day. But you... People who ignore the Israeli role in the assassination are just completely ignoring fact that the three heads of the Mossad were in Dallas that day. The head on paper of the Mossad, Yitzhak Rabin, was there. So is that coincidence? No, it's not coincidence. They were all there. Ted Shackley, Morales, George uh, uh, Ioannidis, all of these guys were there. It was a who's who. There were a dozen mob guys walking around the crowd. If you went and looked at a list of how many known assassins from around the world were in Dealey Plaza, you'd probably find 20 or 30, in particular the Corsicans, um, which were not shooters, but they were there to muddy the waters. And we now know the identities of the Corsican assassins who were in Dealey Plaza, thanks to Hal Hank Alberelli's last book, Coup in Dallas. Hank Alberelli is one of the best Kennedy researchers, but even he didn't get it right. Um, he couldn't see the bigger picture. But uh, yeah, so... Um, the point that I'm making is that the Israeli Mossad connections to the Kennedy assassination are just dripping from it, and it's completely ignored by every Kennedy researcher, particularly people like G James DiEugenio, and uh, it's it's really a shame because Kennedy was killed so Israel could have the bomb. That's the bottom line. Um, secondary reasons, Kennedy was going to cut all aid to Israel, and Israel cannot survive without aid from us. They just can't, even to this day. And so, and then you have uh, the secondary reasons like Vietnam that everyone talks about, Federal Reserve, which I think is all propaganda. Kennedy was not about to get out of Vietnam. He just spent $6 billion on fighter jets and helicopters. He wasn't going anywhere. So the idea he was going to pull out after spending $6 billion taxpayer dollars to me is ridiculous. Um, the Federal Reserve stuff, no, I, that's just, that's to me seems like some conspiracy propaganda. 
Um, yeah, a lot of the stuff tends to focus around reducing the establishment when it comes to like defense spending. And it always focuses on like budget costs. And I don't, I don't like the covert action of whatever the CIA and all those have. I think those need to be kind of taken away or at least diminished to an aspect of um, this idea of regime change is kind of a little bit ridiculous, but I think it does boil down to this basic aspect when people start saying tearing down the government. And I think that's where you can kind of find balance between the conspiracy people and the Warren commission people, which is just like, that's the focus. And that's where the Warren can meet commission people the low nutters they're mostly conservative i started to notice they kind of have this blind faith or blind patriot like they're doing a patriotic duty by saying there's no conspiracy or there's nothing going on here it was just a lone nut and it's only because of the aspect the conspiracy people go the government did it so you need to destroy your government and kind of take it down which i don't know what those aspects are and i don't know how to find a divide or a balance in between those two but I'm sorry, I can. A lot of the things you're mentioning, it's very new. I've never heard a lot of researchers really talk about this. So I wish I could add in a lot more. But I mean, even when it comes to Oswald, did they groom Oswald to get there? Because he was a patsy. I mean, that's at least what I've learned so far. Yeah, they've been setting up Oswald since he got back from the Soviet Union. Period. Like, I think he pissed some people off by bringing Marina back with him. I mean, so Oswald goes over there. He's probably part of a program the CIA was running called AE Balcony. Um, I discovered documents on a program that the CIA was running called AE Balcony that started in 59 and it ran through 62. Um, and it was a program designed to take naturalized American citizens, being people who spoke fluent Russian, but who were raised in America, uh, and then sending them back to the Soviet Union to, to be a spy. They ran that program from 59 to 62. What years was Lee Harvey Oswald in the Soviet Union? 59 to 62. So while we don't have confirmation he was part of that program, what are the odds that program is going to exist and he was there from 59 to 62? You see, come on. Like this to me, like a lot of researchers will look at that and they'll still scratch their heads. Like that's ridiculous. If the, the, the years he was there completely coincide with a program that are just, that's describing exactly what he was doing. So, yeah, to me, it's obvious he was part of that program, whether we can prove it or not. It's another story. What's your idea of Oswald? There's many different people that have varying opinions on who Oswald was as a person, which makes him kind of hard to narrow down. It's much like the Mexico City trip. I have no fucking clue what to believe. He didn't go to Mexico City. OK, not at all. I can that I can prove because uh, on the 20s and then real quick, I will just touch on this. I mean, he was supposed to have been in. Uh, Mexico City on the September 26th. He was supposed to have arrived there the morning of the 27th at 10 a.m. However, the 27th was the day of the Sylvia Odio incident, right? But Sylvia Odio wasn't Oswald. Sylvia Odio, the three men who visited her were Lauren Hall, Lawrence Howard, and William Seymour. William Seymour was one of two men impersonating Oswald all over the place for at least two years. Well, that okay. that I know for a fact, because there's multiple people talk about shooting a target, saying this is what I'm going to do to the president. If you're going to plan an assassination attempt on the president, you don't fucking do weird stuff like that. That was also William Seymour at the gun range. That was not Oswald. That was heard, William Seymour. I've heard people suspect like Michael Payne or someone like that. No, no, no. I, I've heard that, too. But no. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Because we have what we have is we have some FBI fuckery with the descriptions uh, given to them by Garland Slack and by. Uh, Malcolm Price. Okay, those are the two best witnesses in identifying the people at the gun range, right? Well, first off, the rifle that was brought to the gun range was not a Carcano. It was a, um, it was like a copy Mauser 7.65 sporterized that had the wooden surface on the top removed, okay? So Oswald never went there. It's used to show that he had the rifle. It sh it's, it's supposed to show that he was shooting other people's targets, which Garland Slack attests to. Um, but um, Garland Slack saw him there on three separate occasions. Malcolm Price saw him there on numerous other occasions, going back to the day the rifle range opened on September 28th. Well, um, oh, I'm, I'm getting off track. This is a lot of tangents here. So I'm trying to keep this all coherent Feel while free. sticking to my I'll original give, point. I'll give so, you but my all original my point was that um, there are two documents that clearly show Oswald was still in New Orleans on September 26th because he closed out his P.O. box and he left a forwarding address to Ruth Payne's house on September 26th. So um, there's a lot of incidents that happen between September, that, that the Mexico City trip, especially when he gets back October 4th and the the week before the assassination um where uh like yeah the the walker shooting back in april okay the walker shooting was not done by lee harvey oswald and it wasn't even a carcano that was used it was a mauser that was used it was the um mauser 7.65 shell was recovered and not a carcano round 
Also, we have the testimony of the neighbor of Walker who saw two men shooting. And when you come to understand really who the cast of characters are and who was doing what and who had access to the rifle and who was the shooter on the sixth floor and who planted their Mausers and planted the Carcano on the sixth floor of the depository, you come to understand that the people who shot at Walker's house were William Seymour and Lawrence Hall. And then we get confirmation from a guy named Jules Rico Kimball, who knew these guys, who confirmed it was William Seymour and Lawrence Howard shooting at Walker's house. Then you come to realize over a two-year period, Lee Harvey Oswald is seen all over the place with a husky Latino or a Mexican, dark-skinned, dark-complected, and he's got like a pockmarked face or he has numerous bumps on his face. That guy's then, famous. That guy's the one I think – I don't know if that's the dude from Star Wars. Oh, God. I forgot uh... – who said that? It was a little boy that Ruth Payne was teaching uh, another. No, 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 no. Show. Like it was no, it was what it was. It was Lawrence Howard. Here, let me share this with you too. Um, Lawrence Howard is a pockmarked, mole, had mole, numerous moles on his face, dark skinned, complected Mexican, and he was always seen with uh, Oswald. But that was not Oswald. That was William Seymour. Um, let me see here. So I remember hearing that story from like a barber shop to see the Harvey Oswald. With a, it just there's so many different depiction of who Oswald was it makes it fucking hard to understand who he is. Right, because Oswald is mostly a ghost. Almost nothing we know about him is real. Um, he was being impersonated for at least two years, and while he was in the Soviet Union, uh, by primarily two men, Carrie Thornley and William Seymour. There were a couple. Other unique ones like Larry Crawford impersonated Oswald at the Texas Employment Commission, and that was attested to by Laura Cottrell, um, who basically uh, wrote a paper about it. I mean, she was so adamant it wasn't Oswald. Um, but other than that, you'll come to find the um, that most of the sightings of Oswald that were definitely not Oswald. Oswald was accompanied by a woman and a, who spoke Russian and a child, but Oswald was seen driving a car. Oswald didn't drive. Everyone who knew Oswald attests to the fact that Oswald never drove. And we have no evidence that Oswald ever drove except for one driving lesson from Ruth Payne. However, we know that Carrie Thornley drove. And when I made the connection between Carrie Thornley and Marina in New Orleans, and that neighbors had seen Carrie Thornley at Oswald's house so often, they didn't know which one of them was married to Marina. OK, so when I realized that, I realized, holy shit, all of those sightings of Oswald with a child and a Russian speaker, but Oswald was driving a car. That was Thornley. And that was an active part of the setup. And how can we continue to connect Marina to the setup? We can continue to connect her to the setup because she forged the name Alec Heidel on the selective service card. She also forged the member on the back of the photograph given to George DeMornshield, who was also in on this to, Hunter the, of fascist. to the hill. Hunter a fascist. That was written. A handwriting analysis proved that that was done by Marina, not said, by Oswald. They said that Marina couldn't speak and write English. She fucking. She's a liar. She's a liar. She fucking lied. Well, you know that by her witness. <laughs> you know that by her witness testimonies. She lied about everything. And after the assassination, she, she was part of the setup moving into it. She knew Thornley. She was going around with Thornley shooting rifles, particularly um, next to the Stemmons Freeway. Believe it or not, there were a couple incidents where Thornley or someone they said was Oswald was shooting at a bunch of bales of hay off the side of the freeway. Not the sports drome incident. Other ones. Um, and that they were seen with a woman uh, and with a child. And when I realized, holy shit, Carrie Thornley was in Dallas. Carrie Thornley was living at the boarding houses, not Oswald. It was Carrie Thornley driving around with Marina, uh, leaving uh, a, a, a violent impressions everywhere. Like uh, they went to stores together. They did all kinds of stuff. Um, and the the official story kind of ignores it. The conspiracy people say it's Oswald, but it's not Oswald. And I'm saying none of those were Oswald. I don't have a single incident of Oswald doing anything until he shows up at the Texas theater. I can attribute almost every incident we've ever heard of involving Oswald to either Carrie Thornley or William Seymour or a definite imposter. Like this is like the incident down in Clinton where he allegedly went down to Clinton for the voter registration. I completely debunked that whole story. It was not Oswald. It was definitely Carrie Thornley. So I'm, I'm just waiting see, for you to toss get... out that Lee Oswald died in the war and someone just did some type of manipulation to their face to dress up as this. That's no, why no, it doesn't no. look accurate. Okay. No, no, I don't know. No, That's don't know how that. most so, of these horror movies end up is that type of weird um, stuff. So let's talk a little bit about the duplicate Oswald theory that was put forth by John Armstrong. It's kind of hard to avoid and it's kind of hard to ignore. Um, so John Armstrong, did you read Harvey and Lee? I didn't read Har Harvey and Lee, but I'm well aware, like the other Oswald, my buddy uh, Gary Hill talks about that in his book, uh, du Duplicate. So, 
here's the problem with this whole duplicate Oswald thing. And I want to try to explain this from a rational perspective. Um, let me ask you a question. Do you think that it's rational that the Central Intelligence Agency in the late 40s and early 50s would raise a duplicate child under a assumed name for the purposes of exfiltrating them to the Soviet Union to be a spy? No, I think Does that I think totally it's rational. Way more simple than something of that sort. I think it was just somebody using his name and, you know, they set him up in a situation that, you know, whatever. Well, no, no, we definitely have some um, we have basically 10, 12 years of duplicate school records um, of Oswald going back to like 1947. Uh, first in New York at PS 44, then later on down in Fort Worth at Stripling Junior High School, where he was enrolled and students knew him, where he also simultaneously attended in New Orleans, um, Beauregard. There was a Marguerite Oswald and Os uh, Marguerite Oswald lookalike. Uh, this is very real. Um, they were definitely raising another child under the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. But the question is, for what purpose and to what end? And I believe it was just a simple plot to get a spy in the Soviet Union. I believe that whoever Oswald's whoever Oswald's father was, was definitely CIA uh, because, and probably OSS during the war. Um, or he, you know, he died in 30. He died in the 30s. So it's like um, when I was, try and listen to Vincent Salandria and I hear him talk about so much stuff and I'm like, damn it, even for me, that's into some of the cons like to real conspiracies like COINTELPRO and all that. You got to prior it with other events. It's just anybody that's new looking at hearing Vincent Salandria talk, they go, this guy's off his rocker. And it's like, because he's seen way more than what we've seen. And that's why he's talking like that. It's like when I get in a conversation with, about JFK or something, I'm talking to somebody. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, because they're not up to speed because they're not involved in it. They don't know a lot of the weird stuff that goes on. Even the magic bullet there, you try and say that to someone who has never looked into any government corruption in their life. And they're kind of like, well, that's the government would never fake a bullet or they would never, you know, lie like that. It's like, what do you not know about the past point tell pro of freaking creating fake coloring books for uh, the, all the white supporters of the black Panther party and sending it to them. Like, I mean, that's crazy stuff, but when you can show it and have the documentation to back it up, it just helps people get to that level. So it's about getting the world to understand that. But even with the backyard photograph, when Lee says, that's me, but that's, that's my face. We don't know that he me. said that. This is nothing I need to point out. All the people who relayed information that said Lee Harvey Oswald said X during interrogation are fucking liars. So we don't know that Oswald said any of the things that they say he said. At all. Well, I, tr I trust Bart Camp and Malcolm Blunt's archives where he's getting that information from, from Truly's notes or no, Hostie's notes. And yeah, um, I don't trust Hostie. I don't trust any of those guys. None. Hostie true. had been involved with Oswald for since, since he got to Dallas. And not only that, Hostie was involved with George DeMornshield going back to the 50s. He was so, like stalking Marina, wasn't he? I don't know. I, I, Hostie is one of those guys who was like on the outskirts not involved directly in the assassination, but he was connected to people who were like the shield. Like he was involved with a case with the Morn shield in the fifties and they had stayed uh, quote unquote uh, acquaintances uh, since then, you know? So like, it's just, um, it, Hostie's a weird one. I think that he got in a situation, didn't know what was going on. Then the president got killed and he went into like cover your ass mode. That's all you see a lot of that in the assassination. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that because if it was a conspiracy and then and then Hosty turns out that he could have foiled the conspiracy uh, then and it wasn't just a lone nut, then, yeah, it would have been even worse for him. So, well, I mean, look at the number of people that were knocked off in like three to four years after the assassination in that time period alone. I mean, I put like eight on my Instagram story and like half of them were throat chops. I was like, there's more than just one person getting throat chopped. There's a couple of people. And I asked just people that weren't conspiracy people. It's like, what do you think that is just getting a throat chop? And they go, well, that's a train to kill her. And I was like, yeah, I was like, you don't accidentally, even if it's a mugger, you don't somehow throat chop and able to kill somebody like that. That's it's just there's a and I think that's when you look at a lot of testimony from witnesses and people that started coming out later. I do believe a lot of it is like trying to write a second book. There's a plenty of people out there like Clint Hill. His new book was the complete opposite of what he's written in the other five or six that he's Clint written. Hill is a fucking liar and a traitor to his country. So there's a lot of that where people have been doing it for profit and gain, which sucks. But there's also people that were afraid to testify a lot of times as well, too. And that's worth like the various films that I mentioned in the beginning about the number of people that were recording. You know, none, none of those people, some of those people are like, I, no FBI agent. Nobody came to me and asked for anything. I was like, yeah, they weren't doing an investigation. They were trying to wrap it up as fast as they possibly could. Yes. Um, 
but the like with the secret service i want to kind of shift back to how deep this this conspiracy actually went like because the secret service were all in on it uh, obviously because their actions with the leapfrog uh after daily plaza um well their job was to protect the president that did not work right. so well yeah, yeah, they 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 were definitely in on it. And see, you can trace the meetings of the heads of the Secret Service, the FBI. Um, who else was there? Um, there was there were a couple other organizations who, uh, for the coordination of the motorcade, which was handled by the Dallas Citizens Council, met with Sam Bloom. And so Sam Bloom was. When you come to understand who Sam Bloom is, he's mostly a, a financier who was connected to all the fucking corruption with the Bronfmans and all that stuff. So, but you can pinpoint the individual meetings. There was documents showing when Sam Bloom met with Forrest Sorrells, when he had a phone call from Kenny O'Donnell, right? So we know where the coordination of the assassination went down through Sam Bloom, uh, through these other agencies, right? So um, the Daltex was like ground zero, really. Um, so the stories about people getting arrested, looking for phones on the third floor, like, uh, like Larry floor, who is actually Ted Shackley. Um, why does this sound so familiar? It sounds like it's not Jim Mars, is it? Uh, Jim Mars has talked about, uh, Larry floor before, but Larry. Okay. So all of them were there, right? Um, all the guys who were behind this were there in Dealey Plaza. They had to see it's some kind of, it, it, there was a ritualistic aspect to this, and I don't know if you want to talk about any of that, but um, you got to want you're going to watch if you're going to plan an event like this, you're going to watch it unfold and fucking eat popcorn like a sadistic bastard. If you're going to correct, and they were all there, and um, there was allegedly a phone that Larry Floor was going to use on the third floor. But when you start to study the Daltex building, and you come to realize that the third floor. Uh, was actually the Maryland Belt Company, and they didn't have a phone on the public phone on the third floor, and you had to walk into the warehouse floor and around a corner to get to a phone. You come to realize that there was no public phone up there. So everyone who got busted in there saying they were going to the phone on the third floor, no. They were probably going to the third floor uh, as a safe house, probably functioning as a safe house. Um, but it didn't work too well because they arrested at least two or three people out of that building, um, including uh, what uh, Eugene Brading, uh, Larry Floor, couple other people they arrested half of the guys who were involved in the assassination on the ground but see they planted people on the ground to be arrested they knew they couldn't get out of there right like um so many people like dave yaris who was the shooter between the pergola and the fence you know the bullet that was dug up out of the ground uh that disappeared the FBI that agent, was yeah. when, right when you when you line up where that was and you line up where witnesses saw a shooter between the pergola and the fence and then you look at the nicks film that was clearly edited to remove that part of the video of the film itself um, it comes becomes obvious there was a shooter there. When I did my homework on uh, who that was, I determined the shooter there was Dave Yaris, who was a Miami uh, a Miami hitman, but he was Chicago mob. He was a Chicago outfit guy, grew up with Jack Ruby and a guy named Lenny Patrick. That uh, bullet they pulled out of the grass, they never submitted that to evidence, did they? No, I believe the guy who pulled it out of the grass was Gordon Novell. If you look at those photos, it looks pretty clear cut that it's Gordon Novell to me. Um, and then, you know, all the David Ferry's guys were in Dallas. Uh, we got Thomas Beckham photographed at Love Field. Uh, you know, all the guys were there. Andrew Jerome Blackman was, uh, David, so David Ferry was one of the shooters on the knoll. There were two shooters on the grassy knoll. The first shot, the first shot that was fired by Dave was fired by David Ferry was a shot that hit Kennedy in the throat. So and that yeah. one. Well, the only people I've ever heard mentioned two shooters was Blakey. And then also Jim McBride mentioned that two people in alleged Dallas police uniform, the same people that were. No, the, the police uniforms, person. I believe is. No, I believe there was a Dallas cop back in there. Uh, I believe his name was House. Um, I believe you, that you can get a police uniform. That's not hard. Right. But the Dallas police were in on this to a degree. I mean, when you look at the when you look at the. <laughs> When you look at the actions of Dallas police and what they did um, in the in moments afterwards, it's obvious they, they were all in on it. I mean, this was huge. I mean, it was and it was probably coordinated through the mayor down through the district attorney uh, because all these guys were these were, these were Texans in the '60s who worked in government. Right? Give me a break. There were no liberals then. Right? All People except don't understand Roger Craig. Roger Craig and I don't, I don't man. Roger Craig is such a disappointment to me um, because well. First off, he lied, outright lied about their about him personally seeing three shells under the window. There were no three shells under the window. There were only two. When you dig into the documents surrounding the fuck the, the the shells that were allegedly collected under the window, you'll find, uh, and I, I have all this stuff right here. I can show you whatever you want. Um, 
you'll find that all of the initial reports indicate that only two holes were collected. Two holes were collected and handed over to the FBI. Uh, J. Walton Moore. Um, and what was this other guy's name? Um, you can show it if you want. I want to see it. Yeah, let me find it. Okay. So... I'm not saying you're not right. I'm just... I right, right. Just... I need to know what document. Where are you getting a lot of your doc? Are you getting from Weisberg's archives too, or I get I, I get some from there. Yep. Um, uh, it's so hard when you files. when you search for these things. It's hard to find. Like sometimes, like Jack Ruby stuff is labeled under his real name, Joe <laughs> inside or whatever it is. <laughs> oh man, there's when you go through Garrison's miscellaneous files. Those are the best. Like miscellaneous or um, uh, new leads. Right. He's got a bunch of like stuff that was never followed up on, which is just pure gold. Um, but there, yeah, tons of stuff. But see, fucking Garrison was slick when Garrison organized his files. Right. So um, David Ferry allegedly went to the Winterland ice skating rink. Right. You know that story. Mm -mm. OK, so after the assassination, David Ferry's alibi was that he went ice skating in Houston. So um, I figured you'd know about that. That was uh, that's a. No, nobody's mentioned that. Um, a lot of people haven't mentioned David Ferry. I haven't even really dived into Garrison's investigation yet. The, a lot of stuff what I've tried to, I mean, I've tried, you know, I'm trying to talk to as many people as I possibly can. Everyone's got their own individual angle. But for me, the whole thing is like, if you're going to get people to the level of conspiracy is the most things that we can easily get people to just see that there's a problem here to get transparency. And that is the fact that there was a cover up of what happened to the president. There's a lot of things that didn't add up. And then all this details and all this stuff is after people are already hooked in and see the conspiracy, we can just show them this and get to the, who the actual shooters are. I mean, I get from a research aspect of trying to point out the individual people involved in this type of thing. But I feel like even it's like with the medical evidence, you try mentioning that to someone who doesn't know anything about a bodily autonomy or just all that medical stuff in the first place, their eyes glaze over. Yep. I, I, and trust me, I know it's hard. That's why I'm just writing a book. My book will be done in about two months. I, I'm like 10 chapters in. And so that's going to be, that's going to be, that's going to explain everything. I'll have you back on to promote that if you want. Yeah, definitely. Um, this is um, like the original document that came from the Dallas Police Department of what they collected, 6.5 spent rounds, two, live round, 6.5, only one. And so later on, I wish I had the newer, when you look for the official version of this of this document, you can see that instead of two, they wrote over the two with like a pen and turned it into a, into a three. Um, when you look at the crime scene reports, two spent holes from sixth floor window. And this is, is this the FBI's report. This is the Dallas police uh, crime scene report. Two spent holes from the sixth floor window. Um, this one is from J. Doyle Williams. J. Doyle Williams is the FBI who received the fucking rounds from the Dallas police. And he says here, uh, two photographs were also made on November 22nd of two 6.5 ammunition holes obtained from Dallas police department. Also photographs along with two above was one live round. And this is that photograph, two holes with one live round. This is what is in all the documents up until they change them all. And so a week after the assassination, and this is the proof of this, a week after the assassination, Vince Drain on November 27th, um, this was from Hosty. Hosty. I don't know how he ended up with the damn thing, but um, it says... When Detective, oh, Detective Doherty had it. When Detective Doherty returned from the Identification Bureau, he returned the one empty hall which I kept in my possession. Oh, so he must have given it to Hosty. Several days later, I believe on the night of number 27th, Vince Drain of the FBI called me at home about one o'clock in the morning and said that the commission wanted the other empty hall and a notebook that belonged to Oswald, okay? So you're telling me that they only collected two, photographed two, turned over to the FBI two, and now a week later, they realize they need a third round, and then they fabricated one. And that's exactly what the fuck happened here. Um, this, if nothing else, this is an absolute break in the chain of custody of a third hull. So you cannot include a third hull in any evidence against Oswald, period. So yeah, there was only two hulls. And when they realized they needed a third, they fabricated it. That's exactly what they did. And all these guys are crooked. All the Dallas cops, all the Dallas FBI, the Dallas Secret Service, they were all just, they're so corrupt. They just all went along with it. When it comes to Oswald being in Dallas custody, my viewpoint that I've always said to this of like people always say, why didn't you know Oswald get enough protection? What, what was all that? I go, well, you got to understand that allegedly they have the killer of the president in their midst and they 
got to realize that the FBI, CIA, and everybody's now going to be, you know, going in there, investigating a bunch of stuff. And I feel like Dallas police had a bunch of side activities going on. Obviously, they didn't want being exposed. We don't know anything except for what they tell us, and they're all liars. So we can't really, we just don't know. So that's why when I say we don't know what Oswald said, we have no idea what Oswald said at all. And when it comes to Roger Craig being a liar, I just show you how all the documents said there were only two holes until they realized they needed a third. And then he just happened to keep one of the F, one of the Dallas guys just kept it in his possession, just kept around in his possession, like completely breaking the chain of custody. I mean, that evidence is just no good. Uh, and then when you have Roger Craig coming out saying that he saw three holes, he lied. Why did he lie? That's what I want to know. Why did he lie? Because he didn't see three holes. I promise you he didn't. So to me, that discredits almost everything he says, even though he says some other things that are corroboratable, like uh, seeing the um, what he described as a Negro um, driving a station wagon when Oswald allegedly runs down the side of the book depository. That was not Oswald running down the side of the slope on the side of the book depository, getting into the car, the Rambler station wagon. That was William Seymour. And he was getting into a car with Lauren Hall and Lawrence Howard, who were the shooters on the sixth floor. And to me, this was pretty easily provable. We have statements from Richard Randolph Carr. We have statements from Arnold Rowland that placed the shooters on the sixth floor, one being Husky Latino. One of them even said he had something wrong with his face, like he had a pockmarked face. Let me show you a picture of Lawrence Howard. Do you have a picture um, of William Seymour too? Yep. I wonder how close he looks to Oswald. Um, here's the thing with looking close to Oswald. He was the same height, same weight, same build, um, same receding hairline. And that's all you really need. That's all you really need. You didn't have to be identical, just close enough so to when the two people were not seen together, their images would not be scrutinized. Um, we also got to talk about how they get to the theater as well, too. I have some questions. Oh, yes, the theater. That's I love that story. The real story, that is. Um, I probably don't know the real story. No, most people don't. Um, okay, so... Uh, that's Lauren uh, Lawrence Howard on the left, William Seymour in the middle, and Lauren Hall on the right. I have another – I got something else I'll show you as we move forward. How the um, fuck did Roger Craig mix up Seymour and Oswald? He's got a beard. He looks – he does well, not look this is a, white. This is a – but here's the thing. This is a, this is about two years before the assassination. At the time of the assassination, his receding hairline is very pronounced – um he doesn't Looks have like an beard. abercrombie and finch model <laughs> i will show you some film of william seymour here coming up i'll show some naked photos please do make my show <laughs> but uh this is lawrence howard on the left he's a big husky mexican and he's got numerous moles on his face and very rough textured skin often described as having a pockmarked face um you'll find well, that oswald was seen with a husky latino with a pockmarked face for a good solid two years prior to the assassination and just so happens that during those two years, uh, these three guys, William Seymour, Lawrence Howard, and Lauren Hall, were all working together with Jerry Hemming and the Interpen Group down in No Name Key, right? Allegedly training the anti-Castro Cubans. These three guys were at the Lake Pontchartrain uh, training facility. They got raided by the FBI that David Ferry was all pissed about, that all the, the arms got stolen by the FBI. That was true. The FBI was getting pissed at the CIA, and they knew they had a camp, and they shut them down. Um, so... Yes, these three guys, Lauren, Lawrence Howard, William Seymour, and Lauren Hall, uh, these three guys went around, and particularly in the months leading up to the assassination in Dallas, setting up Lee Harvey Oswald all over Dallas. These are the three men who went to Sylvia Odio's house. Howard and Seymour are the two guys who went to the shooting range. Howard and Seymour are the two guys who shot at Walker's house. Um, Howard and Seymour are also seen together uh, and where Seymour is identified as Lee Harvey Oswald in a bar in the French Quarter where um, Seymour actually uh, gets drunk and starts throwing up everywhere. And he's seen – they say that Oswald was carried out by his big Mexican friend. So it, to me, it was obvious because when you really come to – like I said, it's a study of relationships. And when you understand the cast of characters, and there is a distinct – cast of characters an inner circle and when you come to understand who is in that inner circle you come to realize there's only one mexican with a pockmarked face or who could be interpreted as having any kind of moles or bumps on his face and that's uh lawrence howard so it's the same guy being seen with oswald all over the place where seymour is identifying himself as oswald like particularly like bolton ford great example of bolton ford and these two guys go to bolton ford in uh 1961 january of 61 
Um, where the hell is Lee Harvey Oswald in January of 61? He's in the Soviet Union. Nonetheless, these two guys go to Bolton Ford. They ask about getting a bunch of trucks for the Friends of Democratic Cuba, which is an operation being run out of 544 Camp Street, which is where Guy Bannister is working out of, right? Guy Bannister, where allegedly Oswald's flyers were stamped with 544 Camp Street, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee flyers. Those flyers were not printed by Oswald. He was not a, <laughs> he was not a member of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He was being set up by Kerry Thornley. All that stuff in New Orleans, connecting him to the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, was just setting up a legend. That's it. That's what they were doing. Um, Weitzberg, he went and talked to Douglas Jones of Jones Printing, who printed those flyers. And Douglas Jones refused to identify Oswald, and he identified four pictures of Kerry Thornley as the man who came and picked up those flyers. He also gave the name of Osborne, Leon Osborne, when he picked up those flyers. So they were experimenting with aliases at this time. But he had those printed, and uh, it was a screw-up on Kerry Thornley's part to put the 544 Camp Street, not Oswald's. Oswald was a fucking patsy, and he that was his job. Here, Lee, go hand out these flyers on the street today. That's your assignment. His whole communist persona was a front, and the reason that he, I believe he kept it after he got back from the Soviet Union, because I think they were going to try to repurpose him as a spy to get him into Cuba. But that didn't. they didn't do that. They ended up repurposing him as a patsy for the, for the assassination. So, do you agree with his personality where people say he was kind of quiet and didn't talk much? Yes. Do you believe that he was on the spectrum? No. Okay. No. There are no. certain aspects no, of guy his, was a spy. I know, but there are certain aspects of his character that were it seems very astute and not really super military esque, but more like OCD kind of that I started to notice. Like the things that got me were like he didn't like people who knew him say he didn't curse. But then Marina comes and says that he curses and drinks and beats her, right? Totally. Her stories about Oswald are completely opposite to reality. But then you have um, Oswald. The Oswald when, I, when I know someone's really Oswald and like sifting through the sea of Oswald sightings, Oswald always had a fresh shave. His hair was always clean and neat. His clothes were clean and neat. He was very tidy. Um, and when you look at some of these Oswald sightings all over the place, he's like, you got like two days worth of stubble. He's smoking a fucking cigarette. Um, I mean, like things that are just when you come to really kind of get a grip on the the real Lee Harvey Oswald, it seems as though like it becomes obvious which ones weren't him. And then I couldn't find any that were. I couldn't find any that were him. And none of the sightings that I knew of Oswald were him, except for the stuff that involved George DeMorn Shield, Ruth Payne and Michael Payne. Like they were handlers and they handled him in Dallas. And other than that. I cannot find a single incident involving Oswald until Oswald shows up at the Texas theater. Almost like he was a real spook out doing spook stuff elsewhere and had no idea any of it was going on Had no idea he was getting set up. Like he probably, you know, there was some um, Jennifer Lake did some really great work on him possibly being a, an atomic agent, like who was doing like undercover stuff involving um, our atomic infrastructure. And there's some decent evidence there. So who do you knows? believe Judith Baker when she talked about how Oswald was a runner for that lab stuff? No, no, she's a liar. Okay. Um, when it comes to Oswald, do you think that possibly a lot of those sightings that people saw of an alleged Oswald, do you think at that time, Oswald, the real Oswald was actually maybe being brief somewhere? They did something to keep him out of the public. So there can only be okay. 100%. Like, particularly the day of the assassination. I don't believe Oswald was at the, I don't believe Oswald worked at the depository. I just don't. Um, I can find next to no evidence that Oswald ever attended any of the jobs he's alleged to have attended, like uh, uh, Jagger Child Scovald and like um, Riley Coffey, which was definitely a CIA front, right? Like, so you got to think the CIA nurtures relationships and then they get people who have businesses and then they're like, hey man, I got a couple guys I need to get on a payroll. Um and they do some money laundering thing. They pay them or buy product or whatever, get them money, and then they get their guys on the payroll, and their guys don't have to show up. The mob does the same stuff. So there's um a truly interview with uh, Oswald where I mean he gives a description of Oswald, but then there's a lady that also did I think I don't know if it's an interview or not, but she talked about the Oswald that I hired that worked at the book depository was not the same one that went into my office and also claimed to be Lee Hart. That's Larry Crap. That's Larry Crawford. Yeah. Um, so that woman, Laura Cottrell at the Texas Employment Commission, 
the woman, uh, I'm sorry, the man that she says came in and said he was Lee Harvey Oswald was subsequently identified by her as a guy named Larry Crawford. Larry Crawford was a hang around at Jack Ruby, worked at the Carousel Club and dipped out of town on November 22nd. But he's kind of he was a low level CIA guy. He was he had been involved with um, um, these uh, traveling carnivals. OK. And when you come to understand the CIA smuggling operations in America in the 50s and 60s, you come to understand that they were using state carnivals. Hell, they were using um, ice capades and Disney on ice as smuggling fronts. Um so, yeah, um, <laughs> that relationship with Walt Disney and Hoover goes a little bit deeper than expected. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100 percent. But um, I'm sorry. I totally lost my point. Uh, I have. I Let's get to the theater. Let's get to the theater. I got to get to the theater. It's good. You're, right. you, I mean, you're giving me plenty of time. I'm just I'm like I said, I'm, I wish I could help you out with a lot of this stuff. But not everybody kind of talks about any of these things. I, I try and stick with the basis of what we can conclude. I think everyone can get to the level that somebody was using Lee's name. And I think on those bases, uh, you know, we can all agree on those things. I think for the general public to just understand that first and then the minute details, everyone can just fuss over later. But, you know, when I have friends or people that listen to this and they hear it and they go, OK, I know that now. I know that now. And they look it up and it's like, good. Yeah. Find the stuff that you can easily get there with and then look that up and then start digging a little bit deeper. And that's kind of what, you know, it's kind of working your way back. I think the whole reason even Blakey's investigation of pinning it on the mob. I mean, I had Blakey on the show talk about Oswald was an intelligence agent, which is the first time he's ever said that in his whole career, basically. But well, I have a story I can tell you about Oswald. That I have. This is like as close to firsthand information as I've ever gotten. Um, I have an associate who has been kind of a mentor to me, a historian who has kind of solved Kennedy years ago and kind of guided me on my work. Like wouldn't give me any answers, but kind of like was there to tell me when I was being retarded, you know, and just so happens he's, he was a Kennedy researcher for a long time, did 9-11 also. Um, but it, by coincidence, he's from North Carolina. And Oswald's last phone call was to North Carolina, right, to rally. And people try to say that, um, you know, you have Nags Head, which is naval intelligence right there, right next to Raleigh, right? So people had kind of speculated, was Oswald CIA or was Oswald naval intelligence? Well, my associate, uh, his father, uh, while he was growing up, owned a business. And his father employed the son of Oswald's handler who told him everything. Um, and he won't tell, he won't even tell me all the details. He's going to eventually write a book. But um, so my associate knew Oswald's handler and his son. And he says with 100% certainty, Oswald was fundamentally Navy intelligence on loan to the CIA for this operation. So uh, that I thought was pretty interesting uh, that the son of uh, the handler worked for my friend's father. It doesn't really you can't really get much more corroboration than a direct line like that. So but of course, I, I can't prove that, but I know it to be true. Have you ever so. looked up a name, Walter Coughlin? It's ringing a bell. I can't really Secret, say why, Secret but it's ringing a bell. Guy. Secret Service guy. Kennedy connected. You're not talking about the, the, the dead Secret Service agent, are you? I, I think he might still be alive. He's a 100 percent Warren Commission fanboy, but he was a Secret Service agent. I think that was the one trip on Kennedy's the Dallas trip was the one trip he did not attend, but he was, Oh, he's seen photos multiple times by Kennedy's um side and walking with him like airplanes back and forth. And, but that was the one trip he didn't go to. And I don't know if you could do research on him. My grandma was married that guy. And um, really? Like, yeah. So that's my grandma's interest no into the assassination was that. And then like, after she passed, I got into the assassination and then I found out that information later. I was like, damn, I should ask those questions. But it was always this aspect where she was like, he was a bad guy. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And you kind of look at the values of whatever back then. I mean, times are different today, but I just, I, you, that was a weird connection you had. I weird connection I have. And then I had a past guest who wasn't even on to talk about JFK. But he was a he knew I liked the JFK topics and he was talking about men's health when he was on the show. His name is Michael Revito. And he goes, I won't say this on air, but I used to be a busboy where Arlen Specter used to frequent. And every time he would come in, what he would ask for was one martini on a tray by itself with three olives on a toothpick slid right through, placed directly on top. 
placed directly in front of him, not off to the side. It had to be directly in front of him. And I go, when you look at stuff like that, and that's with all these government officials, there is so much weird shit where it's like, it's not even evidence on anything. It's just weird. I mean, Johnson pissing on Secret Service member shoes. There's like so much of that weird stuff in our political organizations. I'm like, that's the real conspiracy. He's trying to get the public to understand that there's all this weird bohemian growth and all this type of stuff that goes in all these government officials. <clears throat> so. I know we're going to get to the theater and I want to get to the theater <laughs> and, but there is, there was in Dealey Plaza, a ritual being observed unquestionably an occult ritual. Um, that one probably better if we just t talk about that one off the air. Um, but Let's get to the theater. Okay, so the theater directly connected to the shooting of J.D. Tippett. All right, so J.D. Tippett was in Daly Plaza. He was not a shooter. He was standing on Houston Street. He's captured in the Robert Hughes film, clearly standing there. So all of the conspiracy shit about him being a shooter or dog dog boy or whatever, the dog man or black dog man, that's what they called the, the, the uh, photograph uh, from the Mormon photo, which I always laughed at. Like it was a bunch of fuzz. Couldn't really see what that was. But J.D. Tippett's in, uh, standing on Houston Street. David Ferry is one of the shooters on the knoll. After the shooting, David Ferry makes his way back to a gray Plymouth behind the Texas uh, School Book Depository, where for a, he has a brief encounter with uh, J.D. Tippett. After that, uh, J.D. Tippett heads from Dealey Plaza to the Gloco Station on North Zang in Dealey Plaza. And what's significant about that is the fact that he was seen there at about 10 minutes till one o'clock and he's parked in such a manner. He's in his car and he's just sitting there, but he's looking at the overpass that comes in from downtown Dallas to Oak Cliff. And there's a bus stop right there. So J.D. Tippett is supposed to be there to pick someone up or arrest somebody or shoot somebody or whatever, but he's supposed to be there to snatch up whoever's getting off the bus. That just so happened to be the same bus that Oswald allegedly got onto. But Oswald never got on that bus because Oswald, Oswald was never in Dealey Plaza that day. And we'll get to that. But J.D. Tippett is at this bus stop. The bus comes and goes, and nobody gets off the bus. He panics, and he heads to the Top 10 record store. He gets to the Top 10 record store, and he rushes in. He makes a panicked phone call. And the uh, clerk says that he basically let it ring long enough for it to go like seven or eight times and then hung up and then ran out of the store. After that, he leaves and he gets on 10th and he heads towards the area of Patton where he's eventually shot. At about one o'clock or 101, he pulls over a guy named Stephen uh, Andrews and he cuts him off the road. He basically cuts him off. So he pulls off the road and he runs back to his car and he looks in the car. He doesn't say a word to Andrews. He looks in the car, he looks in the back seat, runs back to his car, and then drives away. Tippett is so caught up. He gets to the area where he's about to be shot, and he's so stressed out or panicked or caught up in something that he doesn't even realize that as he's pulling over on the side of 10th Street, he gets rear-ended. A woman bumped his car as he's there pulled over on the side, and he didn't even notice, and she kept going. Now, he's there by 104 on the corner of 10th and Patton. He's on 10th by then blocking the alley between 404 and 406 East 10th Street. So now, allegedly, we have the story of Oswald getting on a bus and then getting off and getting in a cab. None of that shit ever happened. I think I know who got in the cab. It was not Oswald, but it's a whole rabbit hole if we talk about it today. So let's just say that somebody gets dropped off by William Whaley's cab couple blocks away from the boarding house 1026 North Beckley. He's dropped off with around 11 to 13 minutes to spare before the next sighting of Oswald, which is at exactly um, one o'clock. And Oswald will eventually be said to have left the boarding house at 101 or 102 p.m., which is perfect timing. Um, so the person gets dropped off and they have at least 11 to 13 minutes before they end up showing up at the boarding house. But I don't think the person who got dropped off at the boarding house was the person who was residing at the boarding house. I believe there was a second safe house in the area. 
And I believe that this person, and this is the only thing that can account for this time gap, that this person is dropped off by William Whaley and they go to another, another safe house. In that safe house is Carrie Thornley. Carrie Thornley had been cited that morning a couple times throughout Dallas, not only at the top 10 record store where J.D. Tippett had just been, um, but also at the Jiffy store where he bought uh, Pico Brittle and beer uh, and had to show ID, showing the name Oswald uh, to, clo- to, a, to the clerk, I believe his name was Moore. So we've got Oswald sightings all over the morning while Oswald's supposed to be at work. And this is Carrie Thornley, okay? Um, researchers, I don't know why they couldn't figure this out to me. It took me two years to figure this out, but some people have been doing this for 20, 30. This is unacceptable. Um, Carrie Thornley is the one staying at the boarding house. So I believe, and he was also the one staying at the other boarding house on um, that was being run by Mary Bledsoe, uh, who also just happens to be a witness to Oswald being on the bus. But her whole statement was debunked later. So um, make a long story short, the person gets dropped off by the cab. They go into the other safe house. At this point, they then alert Carrie Thornley because this is on a schedule. This thing is timed down to the minute because they have bus routes that they have to keep in mind. They have all kinds of stuff. They, they knew they had to have Oswald in the theater at a certain time. They knew how this would play out, what the time frame would be. This, this had to have all been done on a schedule, a very tight schedule. Carrie Thornley leaves that second safe house and arrives at 1026 North Beckley boarding house. He's wearing a white t-shirt. This is where, um, uh, jo- uh, what's her name? Not Gladys Johnson. Uh, Roberts uh, is the boarding house manager. She says Oswald comes in about one o'clock and that he's there just long enough to grab his jacket uh, and head out again. So he's there for seconds. While he's in there, a cop car pulls up and honks the horn twice. Inside that cop car are Captain Westbrook and Sergeant Croy. Those are the two cops in that vehicle. I determined this by going through all the police officer statements and where they were and what they were doing. And these two fucking guys lied about everything. Um, Hell, Westbrook even lied about his vehicle, a lie about what kind of car he had, because he had a personal issue. He had an issue a vehicle that was uh, not marked. It was an unmarked car. It's the car that ended up arresting Oswald out of the theater in Oak Cliff. But uh, in his testimony, he states that he didn't have a car that day, which is contradicted by the fact that he was driving that car that day. So um, I was able to put Westbrook and Croy in that vehicle. What they do is they go to the boarding house. They honk the horn twice. And everyone's always wondered why they did that. Well, obviously they did it because they were picking up whoever was at the boarding house. So they honk the horn twice. They drive off towards Zhang Boulevard. Carrie Thornley exits the house, walks and meets them on Zhang Boulevard at precisely 1.02 p.m. It then takes them three minutes to drive the 0.8 miles down to uh, the area between 404 and 406 East Patton. Carrie Thornley's in the back seat. He gets out of the car. As they pull into that alley, David Ferry is already waiting for them at the alley. David Ferry um, had met Tippett behind the book depository as per a witness named Velma, who we can I can go into that a little bit later on. Um, but um, he then meets Tippett at the area of the Tippett shooting at 10th and Patton. And how do we know that there were two people there, two shooters involved with uh, JD, the shooting of J.D. Tippett? And how do we know one of them was David Ferry? because of the witnesses that provide a description starting with Ed Hoffman and Velma back on the grassy knoll and behind the book depository to Frank Wright, Akilah Clemens, and Doris Holen at the Tippett shooting, who all provide the same description of the same man wearing a dark blue hat with a or black hat with a, with a felt band, um, uh, a dark blue suit. And he was kind of short, but not really heavy, but he was kind of chunky. Um, and he drove and he was located away in a gray Plymouth and he was located at both the, uh, behind the Texas School Book Depository scene in the Gray Plymouth, and again by Frank Wright in the Gray Plymouth at the Tippett shooting. So yes, David Ferry was the first, was uh, one of two shooters of Tippett. Carrie Thornley was the other. After shooting uh, J.D. Tippett, uh, David Ferry then gets in the Gray Plymouth, and he heads to an address on Belmont, um, 80, 818 Belmont, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that today. But that's where he goes, and he swaps the vehicles. Again, because that vehicle actually belonged to a guy named Carl Mathers, who was a CIA agent, worked for Collins Radio. Um, Collins Radio installed all the radio stuff on Air Force One and Air Force Two. Um, He was directly involved with that. And he was a close friend of J.D. Tippett. And obviously, he was in on this because he lent David Ferry his car for the morning. So then we have the stories of um, 
from there, see, the, the one thing that's crucial about the tip of shooting is that it happened at 106. It didn't happen at 116, like everyone said. They had to alter the records to show it happened at 116 to, to account for the 20 or 30 minutes that um, this person had vanished before showing up at the Texas Theater, where they say he walked in at 136. But we have uh, Butch Burroughs, who was the manager of the theater and working the candy case that day. That guy said Oswald entered between 1 o'clock and 107. And he took a ticket from Oswald, who was sold a ticket by a woman named Julia Postal at the counter. Julia Postal sells him the ticket. He goes in, sits down. It's not for 30 minutes that we have a second person arrive at the Texas Theater. And who is the second person? Carrie Thornley. Um, so what happens is Carrie Thornley flees from the tippet shooting. He flees down Jefferson. He ends up going to <clears throat> like a secondhand junk shop, right? But it's closed. It's not open. That must have been a point of contact. He runs up this flight of stairs. And he tries to get in. He bangs on the door. He can't get in. Um, as he's fleeing from there, uh, uh, a woman named Dorothea Dean, who was across the street at Dean's Dairy Way, it was a little convenience store kind of thing that she owned. She says she sees all this happen. She sees him pull the jacket off and he throws the jacket onto a tire rack behind the Texaco. Now, if you know the story of J.D. Tippett, you know that the, the jacket was found underneath a car, not on a tire rack. Well, Dorothea Dean actually told Dale Myers that she went across the street, retrieved the jacket, and held on to it until the cops came later on. So whose jacket was planted underneath the car? N wasn't the one that was being worn by Carrie Thornley at the time of the tip of shooting. They planted a second jacket because uh, Dorothea Dean clearly gave she gave a great story, or her kids gave a great story about how she got the jacket and gave it to them. They even joked about how they joked with her uh, about she could have paid her their way through college with that jacket. You know, when you give a personal anecdote, like I was a cop for a long time. Like you don't, you, liars don't know to make a personal anecdotes. They just don't. So I believe the story hundred percent. Can I ask who you believe more, or I don't know if you've read McBride's work on Tippett, but do you believe more Dale Myers or do you believe more of McBride? I've had them both on the show. Dale Myers. Well, both of them think Oswald shot him, right? Uh, no, Joe McBride doesn't. Okay, so it was, um, yeah, so Dale Myers is the one who got the story directly from Dorothea Dean. He also got another story from a woman called Doris Holan that proved there were two people involved in the shooting, and he just discards it as, eh, I don't believe him. Uh, he's a hack. He's a fucking hack. Um, he's the worst of the worst. Anybody pushing Oswald did it is a moron to the highest degree. I will debate any person in the world on Kennedy. Eugenio, you fucking find me somebody, I'll debate him because I'm tired, 60 years. This thing is this, this thing is the most important event in world history. It's the most important event in American history by far. We lost our country on November 22nd, 1963. And to see these people who call themselves researchers going in circles, making all kinds of money, not having solved a goddamn thing, this pisses me off to no end. Really, it does. So yeah. I think I've went back and forth on Oswald a couple of times. I don't know. I mean, I say if he did, because I've talked to plenty of people who studied the Walker shooting and very like I said, very different aspects. I haven't really focused on the, the, a lot of the stuff that you just covered but when it comes to oswald taking a shot at either walker or taking a shot at kennedy i was like you can have one but you can't have the other i was well, like you oswald gotta... can't fire at anybody if he doesn't own a rifle and he didn't own a rifle and when you look at the look at the paperwork on that rifle it's obvious that um it was a retroactively created story by the fbi well, there's there's they had an FBI guy at that post office that was there that allegedly the rifle came in. I mean, they you, you don't order a, a rifle under a fake name and somehow get it delivered to your real post office box. That does not happen unless you're set up. A hundred percent correct. Um, and not only that, the money order was fake. And we know the money order is fake because it has ink bleed through money orders at the time have a postal stamp on the front. Boom. But they're done on cardstock. They can't leak through to the back. They can't bleed through at all. It's card cardstock. They faked the money order on paper. And when you flip it over, the ink stamp on the front bled through to the back. It's a complete forgery. They faked all of the documents surrounding the rifle, all the shipping of the rifle, because um, Crescent Firearms and Kleins are CIA front companies. The vast majority of arms shipping companies around the world today are still CIA front companies. But at the time, Kleins and um, Crescent were both CIA fronts. They just the CIA has a whole fucking million army, million people army out there, or people who work in the private sector who just do their bidding and will lie and come up with fake documents and all that stuff. Not to mention the handgun that it was allegedly had the handgun 
The well, same thing. It was rejected by the post office, ended up at some shipping facility, and the person who went and picked it up signed the name Paxton. Nothing to do with Oswald. Nothing to do with Oswald. Um, but I have a feeling the gun that David Ferry used to shoot Tippett in the head one time was then handed off to police and then made its way to the Texas theater because Oswald did not have a rifle. He did not have a handgun. Oswald is a total dupe. He doesn't know any of this is going on. He me- Okay, I'll tell you the story. You don't Actually, just casually... If you know all this is going on, you don't just casually sit in the theater. You know, I, I know the whole spy contact thing that gets brought up, but I was like, I don't think that's fucking it, man. There's that. No, no, he he definitely had contact. So let me, let me, I'll explain the rest of the story. So, um, Harry Thornley can't get into the, um, Harry Thornley shoots Tippett. He flees, can't get into the junk shop. He then from there goes to the abundant life temple. Um, it, it, this, it's questionable on whether he actually made it in or not. Some people say that they saw him climbing in through a window. Some people say they saw him climbing out of a window. It's, it's Who knows? All we know is that the police ended up going to the Abundant Life Temple, um, and they ended up talking to somebody there. It's called out over the radio and timestamped, I believe, at 1.30, okay? So from here, if whether or not Kerry Thornley was there, he must have been hiding out somewhere. He begins to make his uh, ascent to the theater down Jefferson um, at approximately 134, 135, he stops at Hardy's shoe store where he's seen by um, Johnny Brewer. And there's other two other men inside the store. OK, the two other men in the store are Igor Vaganov, who's a low level mob slash CIA guy um, who plays somewhat of a relevant role after uh, the arrest at the Texas theater. And the other guy inside the shoe store is Tommy Rowe, another guy who works there, who was so close to Jack Ruby that when Jack Ruby went to jail, Tommy Rowe moved into Jack's apartment. So (laughs) every single place that Oswald allegedly interacts with somebody has a direct connection to Jack Ruby. All of them. And he set up Jack Ruby to get his apartment. That son of a, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, Terry Thornley, 135, pops in at a pre-arranged meeting location at the Hardy Shoe Store, notifies, okay, this is it. Because the story Johnny Brewer tells and the story Julia Postal tells, and when you go over all the statements surrounding everything at the Texas Theater, I can't even determine who the first cop on scene was. The level of obfuscation over the Texas Theater story is just crazy. Um, When you read through the, the, the transcripts of the radio on the Texas Theater, (laughs) <laughs> um, you have a, what they say is a broadcast uh, that says, hey, we've got something going on at the Texas Theater. Can somebody stop out over the Texas Theater? And then you get a couple cops. Uh, one of them's name was Lyons. Um, you stop over at the Texas Theater. But then when you go back and you read the actual statements of these guys, um, they – uh, say they, they call into the radio and let them know that they're out at the Texas Theater prior to that dispatch going out. So it's like somebody's lying about the dispatching of the business at the Texas Theater. Um, and it appears as though the police actually showed up there before the call was actually made to get them there. So how the fuck that happened, I have no idea. But I went over all of the date stock statements and documents and everything, and I'm still like puzzled as to who actually got there first. Um, it's a who's on first kind of situation. But at this point, when Kerry Thornley gets there, he goes in and he goes up to the balcony. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up a bit because I, I totally skipped over what Oswald is doing this time. So Oswald, I don't believe is at the tech as a Texas School Book Depository at all. I believe that the person who was working at the Texas School Book Depository impersonating Oswald was actually William Seymour once again. Um, and I do have some corroboration for this, um, not particularly that it was Seymour, but that it was definitely not Oswald who was working there as Oswald. So I believe Oswald was in Fort Worth all morning, and then he caught a cab and was driven to the theater by a guy named Daryl Beauclick. Actually, his name is Travy Delano Beauclick, um, and because uh, his name pops up shortly after <laughs> Chief Curry accidentally slips and lets us know that he actually caught him, uh, that the ride was actually given by Daryl Click. And then when you, the research community did a good job uncovering who Daryl Click was, turns out Daryl Click was uh, related to a woman named. Bernice Click and a woman named Mildred Click. Mildred Click happened to be married to a guy named David Leon Miller, which was the alias that was being used by a guy named Dave Yaris while he was in Dallas. There's a whole complicated story there. It could take me an hour to explain it, so I'll just skip it. But uh, Bo Click was definitely a guy who was in Jack Ruby's circle, and he ends up dying in a mysterious plane crash in 1967. So I believe that uh, Oswald catches a ride with Bo Click in a taxi to the Texas theater where he's dropped off. And according to Butch Burroughs, he's in there between one o'clock and one o seven. Okay, 
Tippett gets shot at 106, but they say he's not shot until 116. So the moment that Tippett's getting shot by Kerry Thornley, um, Lee Harvey Oswald is buying a ticket to the theater. The ticket is then taken by Butch Burroughs. So Oswald gets into the theater. He then goes and sits in front of a guy named Jack Davis. Jack's an 18 year old kid. And there's like, it's a 900 seat theater. There's only 22 people in the whole theater. And he sits right down in front of this kid. And then a second later, he gets up and he sits right next to him again. He sits right directly next to him. And Jack is like, what the fuck is going on here? This guy is huge theater and he's just sitting directly next to me. And uh, Oswald sits there for a minute and he gets up and he does that again two or three more times. Goes and sits next to somebody. And after a minute or two, gets up and moves again. Eventually, he sits down next to a pregnant woman. He speaks to this pregnant woman for a couple of minutes. And then both he and the pregnant woman leave to go to the lobby. The pregnant woman leaves, and then Lee Harvey Oswald is sold popcorn by Butch Burroughs at exactly 1.15 p.m., a minute before Oswald allegedly is shooting Tippett in the official story. Oswald then takes his popcorn and goes back to the theater on the ground level where he sits for the next 30-plus minutes eating popcorn until the police come in with a news crew and cameras, by the way, to arrest him. 136, um, Carrie Thornley does, goes by Hardy's shoe store, tips off um, uh, Johnny Brewer that, okay, we're here we go. Carrie Thornley then goes up to the balcony where he stays. There's repeated searches of the balcony. They say he's not there, but of course he's there. They're just covering for him. I've and heard then we one story some... that they found Jack Ruby up at the balcony. But... Uh, yes, and I'll get to that. I'll get to that one too. So that's, that's from George Applin. That's, uh, so that's real. Okay. I'll, that's real. I'll get to that. So... Um, you have Kerry Thornley up in the balcony. Oswald gets arrested, pulled out at the bottom at 1.56 p.m., right? He's pulled out. Of this, all those pictures are at 1.56, give or take. Kerry Thornley is then pulled out of the balcony and pulled out of the back of the theater. And we know that there was somebody arrested in the balcony of the Texas theater because we have a report from L.D. Stringfellow, who was a Dallas cop, who wrote a report, says that he was there when Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested in the balcony of the Texas theater. I have that document. It's readily available. <laughs> then we have Butch Burroughs, who spoke to, <laughs> was it William Manchester? I forget which researcher he was talking to, but he gave an interview. And basically he said that within two or three minutes of Oswald being arrested, he saw another Oswald pulled out of the balcony and arrested. He said that he couldn't believe it. He said that they could have been brothers, but that within minutes of each other, a second person who looked just like Oswald was arrested and taken out the back. Okay. That's from Butch Burroughs who sold out, who took the ticket from Oswald. Now, when you go through Butch Burroughs' statements, all of Butch Burroughs' statements in the early days are typical FBI, Secret Service, um, you know, the official stories, bullshit. But researchers who went back and spoke to him years later was like, he's like, man, I was nervous to tell him what I really knew because, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And he's like, this is what really happened. He saw the second Oswald pulled out the back. We then have another witness who owned a hobby store next door. He was out back and he saw all the people out front uh, who were like gathering because it was a crowd. So he went out back because he heard some commotion there. Also, he goes out back and he witnesses Oswald being arrested and driven away in a cop car. And he wasn't told for like 15 years after that, that that wasn't Oswald, that Oswald was actually arrested out the front. He thought that Oswald was arrested out the back. And he gave that statement to numerous researchers over the years. So yes, there was another person impersonating Oswald. It was definitely Carrie Thornley. Carrie Thornley definitely shot Tippett. Carrie Thornley was the one who stopped in a Hardy shoe store and then went into the Texas theater and went upstairs while Lee Harvey Oswald is downstairs Totally clueless that any of this is going on. And that was one of many incidents where I realized that, holy shit, none of these incidents that they say are Oswald are really Oswald. None of them. So, um, but yes, back to, so you have George Applin. George Applin is in the theater and he's watching the movie. And he later identifies Jack Ruby as having been in that theater. And why do I believe him? Because we have a police report indicating that when the cops first got there, they searched the back alley of the theater because there was a green pickup truck left idling. Now, Jack Ruby was seen earlier that day 
driving a green pickup truck that had allegedly broken down on in front of the knoll. Do you, are you familiar with this story? Okay, so Jack Ruby was seen at the Dallas Morning News. Simultaneously at 11 a.m., Jack, Jack Ruby was seen driving this green pickup truck uh, that broke down in front of the knoll, and allegedly a witness saw a person with a rifle case get out of the pickup truck and walk up the knoll, and this is at 11 o'clock in the morning. That is the pickup truck that was being searched in the back alley, and I know exactly where that pickup truck went after the assassination who ended up owning it. So I can tell you with certainty, Jack Ruby was at the Texas Theater. Jack Ruby was in on this thing from the fucking beginning. He was the man on the ground in Dallas, coordinated all the shooters with David Ferry, whom he had known for 20 years because he he and uh, he and Ferry had been involved with Carlos Marcelo in, in uh, basically running pornography back and forth between New Orleans, Houston and Dallas. Those guys had a prostitution, sex trafficking and pornography and child porn ring going on. Um, and that's how that's how uh, Jack Ruby was connected to David Ferry. Uh, also, another guy, Jack Valente. Jack Valente, uh, at the time, uh, in the 1950s, was running pornography with Jack Ruby as an associate of Marcello on loan from Traficante. Come around 1963, Jack Valente is now the assassin of President Kennedy. Move forward in 1966, Jack Valenti becomes the head of the Motion Picture Association of America, where he ran Hollywood for 38 years at the behest of the Central Intelligence Agency. So, so I forget where I was going with that. But dark world, I can tell you that it's a it's however dark it might appear that I'm telling you, it's ten times worse, way worse. <laughs> we haven't even gotten into the child sacrifice shit yet. Uh, uh, we'll do that in another episode. Um, I don't even know if that fits YouTube's guidelines. I think I might have it talked doesn't. about it once, but they don't even let you talk about yeah. Jan 6 anymore. You got to say Jan 5 plus 1. Right, because YouTube is controlled by the same cabal that evolved from the people who killed Kennedy. That's they Spotify, all the I guy's mean, like from Norway or something. He doesn't give a shit. Well, you got to think. Um, YouTube is run by, what's her name, Wachowski? I, I, can't, I never pronounce her name. Um, whose sister runs 23 Me whose father was a physicist who worked on the Demona nuclear reactor in the Negev desert, which is why Kennedy was killed in the first place. I mean, that whole family is connected to the. Well, I mean, I only, I got one episode on my channel that has a flag. It's a uh, Pierre Corey. Um, Cause he mentioned that, you know, drug that they labeled that they're now using. So we're not even going to mention that one because I'll get it. That still gets you flagged. But I like, I, even though that the whole vaccine discussion, I had both sides of that two different vaccine lawyers with two different varying opinions. And I went through the board at Peter McCullough on, I had so many people on, and then they're just like, oh, we're not going to have that on YouTube. I get it. I mean, it's your guidelines. But what happened? What do you when you adopt the change and apologize for the fact that we spent two and a half years basically chasing our own tail on an aspect of things you can't say that we're end up using now? So it's like, what the fuck? This was a this was I don't like to use the word, but this was COVID was a conspiracy that goes back 20 years at least. Can't say um, that either. It's. I guarantee it's true. I guarantee the man who created it was Ralph Barrick, and I guarantee he did it with his funding from Beth Israel Research Hospital. I mean, this shit isn't rocket science, and when you come to understand who the players are and you see them making moves in new areas, it's like, duh, of course that's where it came from. It didn't come from fucking Wuhan. Wuhan is the Lee Harvey Oswald of uh, of COVID. So, Well, before we get into all that, um, where can people find your links, Corey? I really do appreciate the time you gave me to talk. Hey, no problem. Um, CoreyHughes.org has all my stuff. Uh, I do a bunch of podcasts. I do um, Day Zero weekly every Sunday with Charlie Robinson and Lindsay Sharman. Uh, that's a great show. It's pretty much uh, no holds barred commentary on the week's news. Um, and then I do uh, Understanding Propaganda, which is basically I it's basically me teaching a course on propaganda. Um, that one's a little not as regular as it should be. I've been so busy writing my book. Um, my book, I'm hoping to get, I was trying to get done by the end of the year. Probably not going to happen. Probably happen by the end of January. And then my book will be available um, probably beginning of February. But this is what you're going to get with my book. So my book's going to be 20 bucks. You'll get the book. It's going to be an ebook. It's going to have all the links built into the book, like interactive. Um, then you're going to get all of my notes, like my refined notes, not even like my raw notes. Like you're going to get about 800 slides of my refined notes that'll explain everything and show all the documents um, and access to my chat. Um, right now, I do have a private JFK uh, supporter chat. Uh, anybody who makes a donation through buy me a coffee slash forbidden um, for five bucks gets access to the chat and we can talk. We got a cool little group. There's only about 15 of us in there, but they're a diehard 15. Let me tell you. 
Um, I'm going to link all your links in the description, Corey. Seriously, man, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for listening to this episode. Have a good one.